Amen. So this is the heart of today. As Jesus said, if you want a life that is enduring, a community that is enduring, you built it upon the foundations of his teachings, of his truth. And when we grew up, when I grew up uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, I think society and the schools in which we were really close to some of the biblical norms, not all of it. We had other issues back then. And uh, just in conversations with parents around us and parents in the church, in the school, and looking at the media, we find ourselves really concerned about the, the well-being of the identity of my child. What does he believe is normative? Because in the past, I would send my kid to school, and, and just when it comes to general ideas of sexuality and sex and identity, my kids would be fine. Uh, relatively, the school would generally, when I grew up, teach the same things that I would teach in church or what we teach in home. But things have changed, and uh, this is not the same anymore. So today is really about empowering teachers and empowering parents, but how do I teach my kids? How do I build resilience and biblical faith when it comes to identity, sexuality, in the, in the mindset, in their home? What are the practices? What are the things? So uh, I was so blessed when I uh, saw my friend Nicola de Ocher and um, Ryan Smith at a, a few weeks ago in Course for Justice, a few months ago, at a teaching um, session. And I also, that's where I met for the first time uh, Reitzer Rodseth. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't meet him. I just saw him on TV. So he's one of those people, people when I meet him, say that I've, I know you from TV. <laughs> I know you from TV. <laughs> So um, he asked that he will introduce himself in, in terms of why he comes here. He's a medical professional uh, with a background in anesthesiology, in and um, thank you for flying down. Thank you. I know that you had a few meetings with Ryan and with Nicola, but thank you for flying down. And thank you for coming to make this time to speak to us about gender, identity, and sexuality. I really appreciate it. Let's put our hands together. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Um, thank you for the opportunity to meet you with the um, I'm in English, but my vrouw is Afrikaans. So, Afrikaans is the tal van of love. <laughs> yes. But you can sock in all the good things. But as I get to the technical good things, then I can go to English. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you on this topic, as Russ has said, of identity, specifically gender identity. I am an anesthetist and not criticer. I mean, sometimes when I talk to people, they start to get a little bit sleepy. <laughs> so as you know, if, as you know, find iemand raak so in die slaap, gee my so, you know, shot. This is my family. Um, that's Miranda, my wife. She's a radiologist. My two boys, Joshua and Nathan. That's the posed photo. This is what it looks like in real life. <laughs> I don't normally, my wife still doesn't know that I show this photo. <laughs> so I'm an Medical doctor, studied at, U at Pretoria University, specialized in anesthesia, subspecialized in critical care. I've got a master's degrees in anesthesia and a PhD in anesthesia, and then a master's degrees in health research methodology, which evaluates the quality of research, how we get it, how good it is, how we can apply it. I'm also busy with a master's in Christian apologetics and philosophy um, at SES University. My research experience <clears throat> is focused, a significant component of it, on the quality of research. How do we know something is good? Can we trust it? And I speak about a lot of the issues from this framework. And it's a, sort of the position in which I'm going to be talking to you about. I'm also associated with the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, which I can recommend to you. The legal stuff, <clears throat> I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a child psychiatrist, I don't practice child psychiatry, I'm not treating anybody with gender dysphoria. This is not clinical advice and shouldn't be taken as such, and I'm speaking on my own recognizance, not as a representative of any organization. You know why I need to do this. <laughs> I like minions. <laughs> Got to think about it. All right. What is truth? Anybody? In Gimant? What is, what is evaluate? What is truth? Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? It's like one of these eternal questions. 
So, to say of what is that it is not, or to say of what is not that it is, that is false. Reza has a full bush of thick, luscious hair. It is not. That's false. Me? See, so you're going, yeah. <laughs> to say of what is that it is, or to say of what is not that it is not, there is a lectern here. There is not a unicorn here. That is truth. What, is it? what am I talking about? That which is true is what is real. Truth corresponds to reality. That is the core, that is the heart of truth. It is also what Jesus says, this ridiculous statement, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He's saying that he is the real. He is what waar is, he is what is. Strangely enough, that's what God says, I am what I am. Now, what is love? How's that for a question? Hey? Here. <laughs> Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> true love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other. Love is consistently setting your will. It's a decision that you make. It's not an emotion. It's a thoughtful, conscious decision. It's setting your will to seek the true good of the other, which obviously leads you to ask the next question is, what is the true good of the other? What is the true good of the other? What's this? No, it's a picture of a hammer. <laughs> yeah. It's a hammer. What is its purpose? To hammer. Very good. It's not that difficult. Purpose of a hammer is to hit a nail or something, to hammer stuff in. That's its purpose. What is a good hammer? <laughs> that's, a good that's a good operator. A good hammer is a hammer that hammers well. Right? It fulfills its purpose because it's a hammer. What is a bad hammer? This is a bad hammer. It's going to be difficult to hammer with a hammer. How can you use a hammer well? You use it for the purpose with which it was designed. So you hammer stuff with it. You don't open bottles of wine with it. You can. It's messy. It doesn't work so well. Here's a little thing that children do. What is it and what is it for? It's a paintbrush. It's for painting, it's a car, it's for driving, it's an umbrella, it's for keeping the wind off you, it's a ladybug, it's for looking at and going, wow. <laughs> to know the good, you must know what something is, what its nature is. What is, the, what is this thing? So that leads us to the question, what is a human being? What are we? What are we? Once we know what we are, we know what it is good and we know what a good use, we don't use us, but what our use, our purpose becomes. All right? Let's just step it back for a second. What is, the, what is God? What is the nature of God? Now, if we look at God, God is almighty, all-wise, all-powerful. He exists in a state that is perfect, that is perfectly good. He makes perfect decisions all the time. He is in His very nature Goodness. This is what God is, who He is. He's the most perfect, the most pure, the most wonderful, the most po powerful, the most holy God. That is His nature, that is His character, that's, his, that's like the essence of who He is. But He's a God of relationships. How do we know that? Uniquely, in all religions, God is Trinitarian. He's in constant relationship with the persons in the Trinity in love, in this just amazing one relationship, and He creates us, mankind, human beings, to be in relationship with Him and with one another. And He calls us to be holy. He says, be like I, be like I am, be holy. 
in our relationships, in our being, in our living. We are called to reflect God's holiness, His purity, the goodness. And the instructions that we get from God allow us to thrive and to grow and to prosper. When you follow His instructions for use according to your nature, then you have the opportunity to know Him, to grow with Him, to grow in community, to experience fullness in life. So what is a good human being? Give me lists of what is a good human? Yeah? Kindness? Love? Purity? Honesty? Generosity, compassion, hardworking. Any culture you ask, this is the list that you get. Okay? We know these things to be good of, that's the nature of good human. This is what it is. Good human actions, to love somebody. This is the doing, caring for somebody, sacrificing, working hard, not working too hard. What are good things to do with your body? Eat but not to excess. Drink, but not alcohol and to excess. Drink medication, but don't use drugs. Exercise, do it, not too much. Sex, yes, in his confines. So, true love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other, right? We know what a human is given you an outline. It comes from God. It's relational. It reflects God in purity and in purpose. We know what the concepts are. So this is true love, is to set your will to seek the true good of the other. And God showed that by setting His will to send Jesus to die for us because that was in our best interest, for our good. That is love. That is what He did. That's how it translates out. And so there's then ultimately loving to speak the truth to somebody, to tell them the truth and to do that in a loving way. That is love. It starts off with what is true, and then it's loving to tell people what the truth is. So to tell your son who can't hold a single note that he is the greatest thing in the world is not loving at all. To tell my daughter or a daughter that she's can dance and sing, but she's got no skill in that, is not loving. To give a child anything they want whenever they ask for it is not loving. To not teach them discipline, sacrifice, is not loving. To show them truth is loving. So with that, I want to say that a man cannot become a woman. A trans woman remains a biological man. A woman cannot become a man. A trans man remains a biological woman. Gender is not a social construct. It is bound to biology. Gender is not fluid. Words are not disagreement. And violent, and uh, disagreement is not hate. That is truth, because that's what is reflected in reality. It's anchored in Jesus, and it is loving to say that, because this speaks to the nature of what we are. Right. When we talk about the transgender issue in South Africa, in general, when we talk about the transgender issue, people get really confused because there's so many different categories and they blur it and there's a lot of talking, a lot of heat, very little light. In South Africa, when we start talking about the transgender issue, the first thing that people think about is Casta Semenya. Casta Semenya is not a trans individual. So I'm going to try and give you four categories on which to hang your discussion so that you can think clearly about it, but also so that when you engage in discussion with your colleagues and friends and just in general, you have some information to talk clearly and thoughtfully and can show some truth and some love when you do it. So let's start off with Casta Semenya. Casta Semenya has got a condition called intersex, today called disorders of sexual development. So this means, well, let's take a second. When we talk about sex, it's very basic. Don't let any uh, 
body from the social sciences try to tell you that it's not. You get a male who produces sperm, this is in mammals, and a female who produces eggs. The egg and the sperm get together. It creates a new life, a totally unique DNA pattern, something that has never existed before. It starts living from the moment of fertilization. That is reproductive function. That is the basis of sex. Finished. Like every biology textbook in the world does this. You need to go to university to be persuaded that it's different. <laughs> it comes in two functions. Women and, and humans have got XX chromosomes. That's the sex chromosomes. And men, XY. Now, when you inherit your chromosomes from your parents, you can have a problem with inheritance. We live in a broken world. Down syndrome is an example of you inheriting an abnormality on your chromosomes so that they've got an extra chromosome, which leads to a clinical picture. In the same way, you can inherit genetic, uh, a problem in your genetic material around your sex chromosomes, right? So it's an intersex condition or it's a disorder of sexual development and it's linked genetically. What is that? So you can inherit, you're a female, but you only get one X chromosome. So you've got a thing called Turner's syndrome. It's described by Turner, that's why it's got his name. You're female, you look female, but you're different. You've got a shield-shaped chest, wide carrying angle, generally short, shorter stature, infertility. You do the test, you've got XO syndrome, you've got Turner syndrome. You can inherit an extra X chromosome. You've got trisomy, tri means three, trisomy um, X syndrome, three. You can be a man, XY, and have an additional X chromosome. Now you've got Kleinefelter syndrome. Like Down syndrome, or like the genetic problems that you have inherited from your parents, or me, the balding thing. You can have normal genetics, but as your body tries to manufacture sex hormones or respond to the sex hormones, there's a problem in how it responds. So this is hormonal DSD. As an example, I can be born with genetically XY, so I'm a man, but I've got androgen insensitivity syndrome or 5-alpha reductase deficiency, means I don't make testosterone or my body doesn't respond to testosterone. So if you are in utero and busy growing and you don't have testosterone, your body develops to look like a female. So the child is born, you look at the child, she's female call her Sally, she goes to school, she gets raised as a, as a girl, she goes through puberty, because she's got testes, she starts to produce testosterone, more testosterone. Sometimes this is a partial response. Her genetic script is one of male, so she's taller, she starts to get exposed to more testosterone, starts to get slightly more masculine features, and a little bit of an Adam's apple, taller, wider shoulders, more muscle when you run, you run faster, so you win at the inter-school, you win at the local championships, you win at the, at the regionals, you get selected for the national team, you run internationally, they test your blood levels for testosterone, for doping as standard, and lo and behold, your testosterone levels are way above what a woman normally has, and this whole thing, oh, you're intersex. This condition is very, very well known and understood in the sporting world because of what I've just described to you. When you run in this condition against other genetic women, you do exceptionally well because you have high levels of testosterone and you've been exposed to them all along. Got it. Where's the sin? What I mean by that is, what's going on here? We always want to know where's the sin? What, what's wrong? Is this thing wrong with this condition? So, as a framework, I'm going to use John chapter 9. There's a man born blind. And the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned that he should be born blind? Is it him or was his family? And Jesus says, nobody sinned. He was born this way that God would be glorified for through him. God gives us these conditions, this fallenness, so that he may be glorified through us, through our weaknesses. When he redeems it, the glory goes to him. So Castor, or somebody born with an intersex condition, have they sinned? No, they've been born with an intersex condition in the same way that somebody with Down syndrome has. They've not taken a choice. They've been raised in a specific way. It is just their genetic condition. Okay? 
PSDs. Got it. Or pat. It's vroeg in the ochtend, ne? All right, second category. This is a condition called persistent gender dysphoria. And to help you remember, the picture I'm showing you is of Bruce Jenner. He's a man, was an Olympic athlete, gold medal decathlete for the USA, who then transitioned to become Caitlyn Jenner, this voluptuous, um, in some ways a caricature of what a woman is, and was nominated as Woman of the Year in 2017 on Vogue. So let's talk quickly about gender and definitions. Women have feminine characteristics, and men have got masculine characteristics. When you think of that, you immediately know what I mean. I can't necessarily show you one individual that has all of it, but in the same way if I say, you know what a dog looks like, and you say, yeah, describe a dog to me, it's got four legs, it's got floppy ears, and it's got hair. So I show you a dog that doesn't have four legs, is that still a dog? It's still a dog. We're able to extract from the group what we understand by that. We know what it is. In South Africa, We've got masculine characteristics that are based on my biology. The basis for this is my biology. And there's an expression of that. How does the average South African male dress? I'm in the uniform. Yeah? You know, I'm in this shirt, I've got the chinos, I've got the cats. It's just, that's it. If I was wearing a dress, so you would, everybody would be, all of you are smiling slightly. Is he going to pull out a dress now? You would feel uncomfortable because it breaks the social norm. Men don't wear dresses in South Africa in this scenario. In Scotland, men wear kilts. If I was in Scotland and it was a traditional function and I was wearing a kilt, it would be acceptable because men culturally can dress like that. It is an appropriate gender expression for your biological sex. So it varies based on cultural expectation, but it is grounded in biology. The lie in the media and taught in the universities is that gender is fully divorced from biology. It is fully a social construct. And that's a purposeful statement that's being made. It's being driven because of the, all the philosophy that underpins some of the stuff that um, uh, Nicola will be talking about. It's like trying to divorce waves from the ocean. It's trying to divorce gender from sex, biological sex. Gender identity is how I feel about who I am. I feel male, I feel female, I feel neither, I feel both. Gender is expression is how I express that outside. So it's the behavior, the mannerisms, the appearance, the stuff that I'm doing to you that signals that I'm a man. If I came here dressed as a woman, I would be trying to express a female gender to you. Maybe I was trying to mix them say I'm both or neither of them. But we always use the categories of male and female. You cannot escape it. It's just, it is always there. So Bruce Jenner has got persistent gender dysphoria. This is a well understood, well described medical condition in which people have got an ongoing deep unease, dysphoria about their gender. So I'm a man but I feel like that's the wrong gender. It doesn't feel right. I always, I, maybe if I'm a woman, I want to be a woman, this feeling of discomfort will go away. And it's not just a little discomfort. It's a massive, deep, consistent dysphoria. Life is wrong. Life is not nice. I'm struggling with them. I struggle to hold a job. I've got depression. I've got anxiety. High suicide rates. This is a huge burden. And people with this disease will come to a psychiatrist and say, help me. Like my life is falling apart, I need help with it. So when you talk to them, they'll tell you that they consistently, insistently, and persistently will remember being like this from when they were small. It just didn't fit into these categories. It was always wrong. It's like an itch in your mind. It won't go away. How common is it? In men, it's more common, 1 in 20,000 to 3 in 20,000, and less common in women, 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 30,000. So you would need 100 high schools of 500 each. You have school with 500. You need 100 high schools to have one girl. And now you've got three girls presenting with gender dysphoria in one high school of 500. What's going on? This is the history of gender dysphoria, the, what I call almost like the classic presentation. And 
well described in the medical literature, well, fairly well understood. High rates of suicide, of suicide, depression, anxiety. This is a serious debilitating condition meant to be taken seriously, difficult to treat. So what do you do? So the, the people present to the, to the psychiatrists asking for help, trying to engage in therapy, trying to work them through, how can we help you alleviate the anxiety? If you want to be a woman, and this is causing the anxiety, why don't you dress as a woman? Does that help relieve your anxiety? Okay, maybe. What about we now give you medical therapy to make you look estrogen to make you look more like a woman? What about surgery to make you look more like a woman? So we do a breast implant for you, maybe shave off some of the parts of the chin. Can we make you look more like a woman so that when in the society you can pass as a woman? Does that help? The best studies that we have over the longest period of time show that in the, at about 15 to 20 years, 10 to 15 years, the outcomes on those people are not better. The suicide rates remain high, 40 times normal, high incidence of uh, depression, high incidence of anxiety. It doesn't seem to work. It does seem to work maybe for the first two to three to four years. But then after five or six years, it doesn't seem to achieve the end. So the guy said, well, one of the problems is that if I try to pass as a woman, it's pretty obvious that I'm a guy. I put on a wig, I put on some lipstick, I put on a shirt with, you know, boobs, and I put on my high heels, and guys go, like, people go, oh, that's a guy dressing as a girl. Because I look in my body like a girl, a man. So maybe you can stop my development earlier, before I hit puberty. Let's stop me from developing my height, my width, my facial features. Let's keep, put me on puberty blockers, block my testosterone. Do that as I'm entering into, into puberty. At around 16 years, start giving me estrogen so that I start to develop breasts, softening of the face. At around 18 years, have surgery. This is based on what's called the Dutch protocol, which has now been incorporated into what are the WPATH guidelines. Um, they are not standards of care. They're just sort of a, a broad consensus among certain people on how we think we should treat these people. Does this work? We don't know. This stuff is so new that we don't have long-term outcome data from this. It is so rare was so rare that we don't have enough studies in which to do it. Some of the original work from which the Dutch did is based on 33 patients. They've been followed for about 10, sorry, like five to six years. We don't know what the long-term outcome. What does seem to happen is that in the beginning, again, there's an improvement in the sense of well-being, a reduction in dysphoria, similarly to what we were seeing in the, in the traditional treatment patterns. What's a Christian response to somebody with persistent gender dysphoria? They are born with this cross, with this wrinkle in the mind that's causing them this dysphoria. How are we to respond to them? And I again point to that part of John, Rabbi, who sinned that this man should have this cross to bear? Depression, schizophrenia, body dysmorphic disorder where I've got issues, psychological issues with how I see my body? My answer there is that this is an inherited or a received condition, a state of being. They haven't chosen to feel this way. So to have the dysphoria is not a sin. The question is, how do you respond to that dysphoria? What, how do you act it out? What do you do to alleviate this thing? So what I've done is looked at trans people who were trans, then became Christians. What do they do? So they say, they talk about finding their identity in Christ. I am no longer a trans person. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. The center core of my identity is not my dysphoria. It doesn't define me. I am first a Christian. The dysphoria is something that I carry with me. They'll talk about their cross. Same as people struggle with pedophilia, same-sex attraction, pornography. That is something that we all have to sit with, some type of cross that we all have to bear. What do they do? They stop hormonal therapy. They stop dressing 
expressing across gender identity. If they've had surgery, most of them don't have surgery again because of the invasiveness of the, na of the nature of the surgery. But they return to the expression of their biological sex. What is a Christian who is suffering with gender dysphoria to do? Your body is sacred. Humans are this body and the soul together. We've been given it by God. I told you about its nature. That's what it lies at the core of it. Jesus gave great honor to the human body in that he became flesh incarnate. And we are not to distort that which is healthy and, and well made. There's nothing wrong with a person with body gen, uh, gender dysphoria. There's nothing wrong with their body. Find your identity in Jesus. Your identity is not your dysphoria. Just like in your sexual attraction is not your identity. You are not a gay person. You are a Christian. Just like my academic success is not my identity. That used to be my identity. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Don't have the hormonal therapy. Don't undergo the sex change surgery. That is not the way from a Christian perspective to deal with it. But also medically, the evidence is not supportive that that is the way to go. It's going to give you freedom from the dysphoria. How do you engage with somebody with gender dysphoria? The gender dysphoria is not their problem. My alcoholism is not the problem. There is one problem. Do you know Jesus? That's the key thing. You build true relationships. You demonstrate Christ's love. You show them Jesus. That lies at the heart of this thing. It's the identity in Jesus that is will save them. You don't come to Jesus after you've dealt with your gender dysphoria. You don't come to Jesus after you've dealt with your pornography problem. You don't come to Jesus after you've dealt with your sin problem. You come to Jesus, He renews you, and then you start dealing with these things. Persistent gender dysphoria? Yes? Happy? Right, boy. Now it starts getting a little bit closer to home, and this is what you guys, my parents, one of the reasons that we have come to this thing today. Transient gender dysphoria. Bruce Jenner would have been struggling with dysphoria when he was a little kid. So there are children that present to psychiatrists, to the medical fraternity, because the children are having such dysphoria around their sexuality that they go to seek help. So it's not just somebody... You know, my little boys, when my wife's getting dressed, they run through, find her shoes, and then go laughing down in mom's shoes. Look how funny it is. It's not gender dysphoria. These are people that are struggling with it to the point where it presents into medical, seeking for medical care. Out of these children that come, the majority will not persist with their gender dysphoria after adolescence. Once they go through puberty, the gender dysphoria resolves. That seems to be the norm from all of these studies over here. Every one of them shows the same thing. How many of them will desist? Desist means to stop. Persist means to continue. 65 to 85% of them will desist. So if you've got 10, six and a half children to eight and a half children, looks a bit weird to have a half children, but they say six to eight of them will no longer have gender dysphoria at the end of their, uh, by the end of their adolescence. There's no means to predict which ones will persist or desist. Now, it's interesting to read the literature around it and find um, world leaders in this saying, our team looked at this individual and everybody was convinced this person would be a persister and they desisted. We don't know. We can't identify. So out of these 10, one of those people will be Bruce Jenner, or two of them will be Bruce Jenner, who will continue with the dysphoria until they are 30, 40, 50, but six to eight of them will not persist. In this population of kids, there's high incidences of autism. They've got a very rigid understanding of the way the world works, very rigid categories of what is, what is or what is not. So if you're a woman, you must have long hair. If you don't have long hair, you can't be a woman. Sort of that type of way of thinking about it. Also high incidence of homosexual attractions, same-sex attractions in that population. 
I don't fit into with all of everybody else because I feel different about the people around me. I'm not happy with who I am. I don't know who I am. Driving this presentation. This is the Dutch writing about persisting and desisting gender dysphoria. Before the age of 10, we suggest a cautious attitude to transitioning. Before the age of 10, some girls who were almost but not entirely living as boys in the childhood years experienced great trouble when they wanted to return to the female gender role. We believe that parents and caregivers should fully realize the unpredictability of the child's psychosexual outcomes. They don't know what's going to happen. Be careful. Do I transition these kids now? Because remember the evidence... Maybe it didn't work when we just transitioned them late. We need to transition them earlier because they might do better. So let's transition the children with gender dysphoria. Let's start them on the, let's transition them socially. So you start cross-dressing them and presenting them as a girl or a boy to the population. Start them on hormone blockers early. Start them on cross-sex hormones early. Have surgery. Let's get them to look female or male early so they can transition. There's a major concern with this. What are the implications psychosexually, physically, emotionally on these children if you do that? What's fascinating is that once you take a child with gender dysphoria and you start to socially transition them, 100% of them become persisters. So out of the 10, you take the 6 or 8, you start treating them like somebody of the opposite sex. Their identity is malleable because they're so young and they will all persist, 100% of them. So you're turning desisters into persisters. There's been a big concern about this recently in, the, in Europe because children who have been persisted, who have been transitioned, have started to sue the governments or raise concerns about it. What did you do to me? I'm 21 and I'm infertile and, you know, what happened? How could you do this to me? So the Swedish uh, Health Technology Agency, the UK NICE guidelines, the Cochrane reviews have assessed the evidence base for this, both in persistent gender dysphoria and in transient gender dysphoria. The recommendations or the summary is these studies are weak. They're uncontrolled observational studies. There's insufficient evidence to determine efficacy or safety. Very low uncertainty quality studies and we don't know what the long-term side effects are. What happens to a biological male who takes 40 years of estrogen? DVT risks, cancer risks. What happens to a woman that's taking testosterone for that period of time? Without, after two years on a puberty blocker, people become infertile. Once you start taking cross-sex hormones, just about 100% are infertile. Um, what happens to those that have surgery? infections, nerve damage, particularly when you're having mastectomies. This happening at the age of 15, 16, 17, 18. The Karolinska University says no longer be providing puberty blocking drugs or cross-sex hormones to children under the age of 16. Issues around consent. Can a 16-year-old really know what it means to give up their opportunity to have children? Like at 25, if you ask my wife and I, both professionals, do you want kids? We're like, we'll never want kids. At 35, both of us are busy trying to get I, you know, IVF. Now you're asking a 16-year-old. Concerns about the long-term effects of the drugs and hormones, questions about informed consent, they will only do this stuff in the context of a clinical trial. When you don't know what, what a treatment path is going to lead to, you must do it in a clinical trial. So that if it provides benefit, we can continue to do more of it. And if it causes harm, we can stop it early. This is the framework where some of the leading countries in Europe are sitting at at the moment. How should we respond? It seems to me that no matter what your political persuasion, uh, religious persuasion is, the number one rule is we need to protect children. It's also clear from the data that watching and waiting has a 60 to 80% success rate in those children that present with gender dysphoria. That doesn't mean you do nothing, because the child is a whole. There are other issues. There could be autism. There could be family issues at play. There could be depression. There can be anxiety issues. The child needs to be treated as a whole, not just as some type of gender dysphoric individual. 
he is a whole, he's not just a diagnosis. If there is to be transition, and we live in an open society where people have the right to choose, I think it is the wrong thing to ban it. But if it is happening with children, then it needs to be in some type of registry, in some type of clinical research context, where we can see what's happening, because the whole of society has a stake in what's happening here. Transgender dysphoria. Got it. Casta Semenya, intersex DSD. Bruce Jenner, persistent gender dysphoria. Transient gender dysphoria. The last one. Rapid onset gender dysphoria or adolescent, on, on, adolescent onset gender dysphoria. This is what's being driven in the media. This is new. This is new like a new iPhone. It's happening in particularly young adolescent girls between 14 and 18, and it's happening in clusters never seen before. Clusters of friendships at schools, social clubs, or online. Three or four will come out as being transgender, then there'll be a little rash of kids that also come out as uh, agender or pansexual or bisexual or homosexual in that grouping. There's these outbreaks of it. No prior history of gender dysphoria. Until six months ago, she was a happy girl doing her thing, never said a word about it. All of a sudden, she's a gender dysphoric. It has the features of a fad or a craze. It seems to be sweeping through. It's a high social value action. I don't know if you, when you were going through your puberty, were particularly suave and good-looking, you know, with my pimples and gangly, I can't even walk, you know, shoes, hands, feet, I don't know, bumps, lumps. And now you're maybe slightly overweight, you're not very good at sports, and you're on the outskirts of what has been, you know, the cool kids, and you come out as trance. What happens to you in the community? You're at the top of the pile. You're being applauded at school encourage how brave social media, Instagram, Twitter, online people are saying how brave you are. This is a great thing that you're doing. You're finding your identity. It's a high social value action. It is underpinned or driven by an acceptance of this ideology that gender is fluid, that it is something that you can change, like a shirt. Because if it's a social construct, just changes. What's the issue? It is what you, it is what you, th you are what you think you are and is strongly linked with the woke social justice movement that's been sweeping through some of the schools. And I've seen it in multiple schools. They will have the Black Lives Matter movement, and in its wake, you have this coming up. Not 100%, but I've seen it significantly. It follows in a pattern. Children reject the need for dysphoria. This is gender dysphoria, but they say we don't need gender dysphoria. Because if gender is fluid, then I can choose to become fluid just because I want to. If you look at the sub-edits on Reddit, you know, these, these discussion sites, you can find, it's labeled transmed, prerogative term to those who say, um, you must have dysphoria to transition. Who are you to tell me that I can't transition? And it's linked with aggressive activism, extremely aggressive activism. So again, the Dutch... We don't know whether studies we've done in the past can still be applied to this time. Many more children are registering and also a different type. Suddenly, there are many more girls applying who feel like a boy. While the ratio was the same in 2013, remember it was more men than women. In 2013, the same number of girls as boys. Now, three times as many children who are born as girls register compared to those born as boys. There's been a total shift in the demographic which means that the disease profile has changed. This is discussed very well, I think, in this book by Abigail Schreier. She's a, a, a left um, Democrat, not Christian at all, who is incensed by what's been happening with the children, with their girls. She calls it irreversible damage. One of the lines, she says, in the, in, in the heart of the, in, no, in the internet, there's an army of healers waiting to rip the heart out of your child. The number one rule online is, if you think you are trans, you are. So if you've got any doubts about your identity, anything to you, you must be trans. The next thing is they'll tell you, your parents don't support you, you can only listen to us. Then they'll say, here's how to talk to doctors to make sure that you get into a transition program, and then as soon as you get the testosterone injection, your life will be better. There we are.
So, intersex, persistent gender dysphoria, transient gender dysphoria, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Die goed is nie die selfde nie. These things are not the same. You cannot take data from DSD and apply it to a three, four-year-old who will detransition. It is illegitimate, it is irresponsible. You cannot take data, weak data, from persistent gender dysphoria and apply it to DSD or to rapid onset gender dysphoria. And while there might be some issues of overlap here, this thing is a totally new entity. It is again irresponsible, uh, intellectually uh, fraudulent in some ways, to take data and to say we can apply it to that. It's like doing research on mice and saying I can apply it directly to your daughter. It's not the same thing. When you think about it, when you talk about it, when you access these things, make sure that in your mind you're able to separate these out, understand that they are different. As I start wrapping up, I want to take this step back for a second. Your philosophy, the way that you see the world, underpins in many ways meaning and purpose in the world. And what you believe to be true, you act on. If you believe that cars travel on the left-hand side of the road, you will drive on the left-hand side of the road. You'll look left and right before you cross the road. And consistently doing things that we believe creates the society that we live in. The philosophy of transgenderism, so I'm not talking about the medical side, I'm talking about the philosophy of this, the belief system, is that gender is completely and utterly socially constructed. We're playing word games. They're based on power plays. Sex is totally decoupled from biology. It is irrelevant. If I say I think I am a cat, then I'm a cat. I get a few smiles. You know, I'm not so cat-like. I think I'm a dog. It must mean I'm a dog. But if I think I'm fat, does it mean I'm fat? This is the core problem in anorexia. It's a disconnect between what I believe or think or feel and what is true in reality, one of the highest mortality rates in psychiatry. Is it loving to say that she is fat? If you can be transgender, if I can change my gender, why can't I change my race? This is Rachel Dolazar, born as a Caucasian woman in America, presented herself as African-American because that's what she identified as, ran an African-American help organization, was outed, vilified in the media. How dare she do that? But why? If you can be transgender, why not trans species? This guy presents as Boomer, identifies as Boomer the dog. He dresses in this outfit at home, drinks from a bowl, eats from a bowl, runs around and barks. What about as a cat? What about as a mythical creature, a dragon? Because if you are what you think you are, then what's the issue? So philosophical transgenderism says, because I think I am a girl, I am a girl. And if you tell me that I'm not a girl, you are hateful, you are non-affirming, you are transphobic, you need to be shut down. You're attacking my very being, my very purpose. If I say I am a boy, I am a boy. I must be allowed access to where boys go. If you say no, you are hateful. You are transphobic. You're seeking to destroy me. You're racist. You're oppressive. I'm a boy. That's the philosophy that underpins this. Yeah. That's a lot. Real truth is to reflect reality. And that truth is found in Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And true love is setting your will to consistently seek the true good of the other. And God did that for us by sending Jesus. For God so set his will to seek our true good that he gave his only son, the ultimate expression of love. So our true identity in our nature as human 
But in this new creation, in Jesus, we are a new creation. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's a new thing. The old is gone, the new has come. Our true identity in Jesus Christ, I love this passage, is God sent him, Jesus, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. It's to my heart with our kids who are adopted. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, promising, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but you are a child of God. That is the core of our identity. Thank you very much. Thanks, right? So this is um, really insightful, really helpful to not confuse the issues. You have two boys. They're still very young. I want to ask you, uh, we'll have panel discussions later, but I just want to ask you just to land this for us. Um, what's your oldest boy's name? Joshua. If Joshua comes to you, uh, he's six now. If he comes to you in three years and he says, listen, uh, Dad, I don't know. I feel, I feel like a woman. I feel as though uh, I want to be with my girlfriends. And uh, what would your advice be to him? I'm going to ask a follow-up question, or maybe I should ask it now. Or maybe he comes to you and he says, Dad, I've got this friend at school. And uh, the friend is listening to Aerosmith the whole time, and he feels like a woman, you know? He feels like a lady. And uh, what, what, how should I treat him in school? So those two issues. He comes to you, or he comes to you because his friend has an issue. Eris Smith says, man, I feel like a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we are doing preparation for this already with my sons. So we talk about what, a, what is a boy, what is a girl. So like, you know, when we're getting dressed, you know, the kids, if you've got kids, you know, sort of from about three to seven, it's just, Penises and bums and farts and you name it. And look, you know, and they're getting changed and they want to know. And so I talk about it. What is a man? So the first thing is I teach them God made us like this. And then this is what a man is, what a man looks like, what a woman looks like. Then we talk about what is a man. I'm a man. I understand what it is. So in our house, we talk about a man being a servant follows Jesus. We choose to follow Jesus. So that's a theme that we talk about all the time. Then, I got this from Simon Brace. I said to him, oh, you, see our, you see that cat there? And I point to our two large Great Danes. And they're like, what? Dad? No, that's Rufus. That's the dog's name. No, that's a cat. Can a thing, well, I'm trying to get them, they say, no, I mean, that's a dog, Dad. That's a dog. Can, the, can a cat become a dog? So we're talking about these issues about identity. What is a thing? Can a thing change? We also talk about that God made us like this, that there's a purpose behind being a man and being behind a woman. This is, we also talk in our family about marriage. Can a man and a man marry? No, they can't. They can have a civil union. In law, they can have a civil union. They, even if the, the law changed, they cannot marry. Marriage is a thing between a man and a woman by God recognized in law. So we talk about the issue. Now, he comes to me and starts saying he feels like a girl. One of the things to do there is just watch out for what has triggered this. Where is it coming from? What about abuse? Has he been exposed to something at school, pornography? Is there a child that's driving this behind it? Because that is often one of the big causes, the thing that you need to be sensitive to. And you'll see my kid come, has started coming home with, with these, you know, Dad, what does sexing mean? And dancing in a slightly provocative manner. I'm like, and I know, I now know that there's one boy in particular that's going through some serious issues at home. That is the source of all of this coming through. So first question is, what's sitting behind it? The second question then is to try and see, does, you know, is there something 
at the core in him that's driving this. And the approach that I would take in that is, is to continue to model what it means to be a man in, through myself. Spending time with reinforcing it. And studies show that if you take a child's sexuality is malleable. It's why if you take it and you dress them like a girl, they will start to think that they are a girl. So if you continue to support him and take him along the path of this is what a boy is, they will continue in that. Just be careful that you don't fall into the trap of support the bulls and bry and play rugby that you're not a man. That is what the gender... <laughs> the lights came on while I was speaking. That is, the, that is part of the lie that the gender, um, transgender movement presents. Look at Bruce Jenner's transition to a woman. It is a caricature of a woman. He's 45, 50. My mom does not look like that. That's a pinup doll. Real women like, look like the real women that are over here. So we be careful not to push him into a caricature of this must be a boy. There are boys that have a more effeminate expression. There is room in Christ to have a wide variation. You can be a tom girl and still be a girl because it's a biological thing. So allowing, and children are often very rigid in how they understand that as well. A little bit like the Osberg, uh, the uh, autism side of things. They struggle to break this. If you wear this, then I am the other thing. So giving them the grace and the space in which to do it, to continue to model it, and bring it down to Jesus. Remember, behavior can be copied. I, I can get him to do something, but I can't change his heart. Only Jesus can change the heart. The second issue is your question about what do I do with this person that's transitioning. Your child will be exposed to pornography at the age of seven or eight. If you do not talk, maybe earlier we're going to hear, if you don't talk and engage with the child before that, you lose the narrative, you lose the ground. Unfortunately, particularly now in the Western Cape, you need to have that conversation about gender and stuff before it happens so that you can have the discussion. And you need to be reiterating these foundational concepts. You need to be explaining why some people are confused around this thing and in basic ways that is accessible to the person. And then you need to teach the child to love those that differ because they they are an extension of your family, and that family is called to love them through Jesus. Is it easy? Do you have all the answers for it? No, I don't know. But I do know that as Christian communities, we've come through a whole lot more in the past. I mean, the troubles that we have now are nothing. Also know that God is in control. Trust Him that an identity in Jesus Christ is secure. So like we're trying to equip ourselves now, I think we do that. We take and learn from one another, and then we go forward and we see what works. Srach. Bye-bye, Donkey. Thank you so much. Right, so really appreciate it. We're going to have a, a, how long is the tea break? Uh, it's got a program here. You've got 15 minutes tea break, so let's make it uh, 20 minutes, and then we'll be back for the next session. So get some coffee. Yeah, yeah, it will be right in about seven minutes because that's how long it takes. So you're welcome to have a, just to tell the people around the table, this is what I heard, and uh, we'll start again. Thank you so much. Together, my brother Garth is pastor at a, at a church in Lockwood Strand, the Baptist Fellowship Church. And it's still like a new TS. Yes, Carl and Zoe have been in our community for a while now, and they're an absolute blessing. They really are a gift from God there in Lockwood Strand. Um, they've got um, one daughter, Lisa, um, and their entire family is incredibly blessed. Carl himself is really a, a blessing of God. It's incredible. 
and they are very much involved in marketing and it's very serious. So when they stand up and speak about that, I mean, obviously they're, they're dealing with this piece of it, but they've got a personal experience of it as well. So I just want to welcome you up, and just before we speak, I'd like to pray over you. Please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for good friends in the body of Christ. Thank you so much that you raise up passions and you raise up giftings. More than anything, that you raise up testimonies for a time such as this. And just like Ray said, Lord, thank you that we as the church have come through so much before. And in a time like now, you raise up generals among us to guide us in the right direction because you love us. I praise you for this. And may this talk land in our hearts in the right space. Use them to equip us for what we need for this time. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, God. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for having us. Um, it's a tough act to follow, but um, we, we're going to do our best. Uh, we're a little bit low on the credential side. I don't know if anybody else feels like it uh, in, in the room. Um, we are qualified parents. I can say that much. Um, I am a, I've got a fine arts diploma as far as that goes, um, so I know about a, a bit about postmodernism and, and that sort of line of thinking and truth and truth being um, relative. Um, but more than that, I've got a digital agency, so we are involved in the digital space. Zoe is a strat director at Ogilvy Cape Town, so she also knows about digital strategy and where the world is going in terms of that and the research they have done about where our youth is um, in terms of digital. So, and what we'd like to share with you today, we share humbly because of our own journey in my struggle with pornography that God has set me free and restored. And it's been a, it's been a rough ride. So we came through, um, uh, we at, at the time, you know, went to our local church and said, hey guys, we've got a problem with this. Um, and we were involved with the youth, involved with the band, you know the story. Um, came forward and said, hey guys, we've got, a, we've got an issue here. We've been struggling with pornography for the longest time. We got anointed with oil, got prayed for, got sent on our way, because that's what we do, right? Um, and it didn't help. Um, and we were looking for a silver bullet, so we went for deliverance and we went for in healing prayer. And none of this was a silver bullet that helped us, because we didn't, stand, uh, we didn't understand the nature of pornography, we didn't understand the nature of addiction. Um, and when you put the two together, and when we understand that we are body, soul, and spirit, and you start working with all the different aspects of that, only then can you come to, to true healing. And through all the people that we met, and through all the counselors and all the psychological counselors that worked with us and helped us on our way, we put together something that we call our, like our version of the 12-week recovery program. Uh, based on the, the, the tools that we learned along the way, because we are those, those practical people that go, what is the practical thing that I can put in place? You know, like, don't give me all the Christianese. What is the practical step one, two, three, four, five that I need to do? And as such, we worked with um, psychological Christian counselors. We put together a, a recovery program. We've had several groups of people coming through recovery. Um, and... Um, as such, we have found that our groups have also become younger and younger. So our last group included an average age of 12. Um, that we had little boys coming through our groups exposed at the age of 6 and 7. Um, goes together with a whole systemic collapse of parents divorcing and the enemy knows exactly where to come in and strike with his, um, with his evil. So on the basis, on the back of that, our experience, our own experience and what we've seen in the groups... Um, we've put together this little chat this morning, um, and yes, it is um, a bit casual, but we want to we wanna keep it structured in some way and say we've got f four sort of pointers that we want to give to you as parents this morning. And we want to say, first of all, be in the know. So know what you're dealing with, know where your kids are, know what they're exposed to, etc. cetera. Um, and Zoe's going to talk to us about that. Then secondly, just want to reiterate... Um, what has been said before, and in, in, in knowing your position. So knowing what you believe at your heart and at your core. And then third, have a game plan. It's not parenting by default, it's parenting by design. We need to know what, what are we going to do with our children. Um, and then a relationship, building relationships. So th along those four points, we want to structure this morning's discussion. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Zoe now. Sure. Okay. Um, 
I think the first thing I want to say is that, you know, when you, when you have a baby or when you're still pregnant, there's those antenatal glasses. Um, they tell you exactly how to change a nappy, how to bath a baby, how to... You know, there are so many practical things they tell you to do. And then parenting starts. And then I'm like, when my daughter became a preteen and a teenager, I was like, we are those people with the 10 steps. <laughs> it's like nobody gives you the practical tools. Nobody prepares you for what it is that you're going to face as a parent. So we, being a strategist, we put plans together and then we pivot. We pivot, I think, on a quarterly basis where we go, okay, this is not working. <laughs> We're going to have to go back to the drawing board. And I think it's in that spirit that we come to you today is that we don't have a 10-step plan for you. <laughs> we don't have rules that you have to follow and not follow. We have some principles that we've seen. And all I can say is parenting is the hardest assignment you will get. And it's not going away. <laughs> it is not going away. Signing up for a lifetime of learning, pivoting, strategizing, changing, thinking, learning, go back to go to people, ask for help. That is what parenting is. But the only thing I keep on telling us to, we're not going to stop. We're not going to give in. We're going we're gonna to continue. We're gonna, we might make mistakes, but hey, God, we are a testimony, the best testimony of restoration and God's power in restoring people. So what I did with my daughter is I left my need and my expectation for perfection at the door. She's going to make mistakes. She's going to make wrong choices. But God, and that's all I can say is, but God. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is um, we want to talk about, uh, and this is research that, that come from the UCT Unilever Institute. So in marketing, what we try to do is we try to disciple your children to buy stuff that they don't need. And we try to disciple you guys to buy things that you don't need or to buy a certain toothpaste over another toothpaste. So a lot of research, a lot of money goes into understanding the mindsets, where people are, what are their current behaviors, their patterns, so we can influence it. So that's the evil part of marketing. Um, but what's great about it for me is that it gives me access to the temperature in the room. Because we look at our world through what we see in our house, what, you know, through our little lens, through our church community. But there is a South African society, and I'm going to share with you just some of the research where the youth's at at the moment. This is the sort of generic temperature in the room. Um, the youth are more exposed than any other generation. And they expose themselves more than any other generation. 93% of them have a social media account. And it's getting younger and younger. Um, one of the respondents in the study said, I was just casually checking my Snapchat, and I realized half of my friend groups were, were to together without me. But we were talk but talking to me on Snapchat. That's the reality that your child is facing. They are sometimes excluded from being in the room, but included digitally. And um, these age restrictions on social media that we all ignore. YouTube has got an age restriction of 18 for a reason. Every single teenager I know has got free access to YouTube. Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, it is filled with untoward content. Our children have access to it. The time they spend 
53% spend more than two hours a day on social media. Um, and I can tell you now, it's worse than two hours. <laughs> That's just the average. Um, when they're most active in the evenings, and that is family time. That's the time when we are supposed to connect. That's when the youth's on social media. There's a, a portion of them that's on social media between two and four in the morning. <laughs> um, they will say to you, I'm addictive, I know, but it's indispensable. I cannot live without this. It's part of me. No phone means no life. We are totally addicted. Imagine waiting for a bus for over 30 minutes with no device. Have you tried to sit in the doctor's room without your phone? And that's us, adults, who's already got a prefrontal cortex. <laughs> and just like other brands, people are expected to be best. This is what the youth feeds back. They go, I have to be the fastest. I have to be the smartest. I sometimes have to be the blackest. I have to be the funniest. That is the pressure that these guys are feeling socially. Unless you're extreme, you're nothing. And just the previous speaker you know, spoke about that social currency that you get from making certain choices. You need to stand out by doing stuff peers are not doing. There's this race to be different, to be seen, to be accepted, to be celebrated. 41% say social media leaves them frustrated, or sad most of the time. Um, so they, they acknowledge that this addiction that's indispensable is leaving them in a, a sad space. And some base their self-esteem on likes and they lose touch with reality. So this is verbatim what the youth fed back in the study. This is what it's coming out of their mouths. It's even a stress not being on. I'm wondering how people are reacting to my posts. So I have this constant anxiety of what's the feedback. What I want um, to ask if you could, this is a, a, a experiment um, or activation that was done by Dove. Um, what they've done is they've, um, they've used deep fake technology, and you'll see. So, so, so what they've done is they've taken some of the conversations that your child is part of, and they've used this technology to put the mom in that situation telling the child those things. So it was just a way to say that as a mom, you would never say that to your child. That would never be the message you give your child, yet that is the conversation your child's part of. So it's just, it's heart-wrenching, and I don't even think they touch on the worst of it because it had to be PC. So um, I'll, I just want to play you this video so you could, could get a sense. Thank you. I don't want to ruin the lipstick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Social media can be good, but it can be bad as well. In terms of her building her confidence, it can build her confidence. Marjorie is just trying to find herself now, you know. She's not influenced by social media yet. Most of the influencers that I've seen have definitely had a positive impact on me. Hey guys, here's a beauty hack I'm obsessed with. I am so happy. Look at how cinched my waist is. Look at how flat my stomach is. It's the shortcut to flawless skin. You know that Botox doesn't just reduce wrinkles, right? Baby Botox is amazing. You're never too young to start. That is not me. There are these great powders 
They stop you feeling hungry so you can always skip breakfast and lunch. And you have to treat yourself to a chemical peel. They're a total glow up. They burn away the top layers of your skin and let new skin grow through. Hey, Amojo. <gasps> if your teeth are uneven, you can always file them down with a nail file. It's literally so simple. Find your teeth. Don't put up with your no. thin lips, sweetie. Lip filler kits let you inject yourself at home. Yes. They're my total go-to. Fake eyelashes are so easy to glue on. If you cut your eyelashes off, there's some really great pills you can use. Keep telling yourself you're not hungry. You're just thirsty. Never look bloated again. Look we'll it into your skin. Sexy as Botox. Remember, skinny is never finished. It's, it's... Have you actually seen stuff like that? Yeah. A lot. <laughs> this stuff is on every girl's feed. They're watching, right? I mean... At night, <laughs> when I can't see them. It's scary to me that my kids are watching this and they think that's how they have to look. I saw one of the teeth smiling videos. I remember that one. I remember seeing that all over. I know this stuff. I can't prevent them from seeing these, but I can talk to them about it. 100% always be talking. And have Peyton know that she can always ask me anything. My mom has taught me not to listen to people like that and to be proud of who I am. called influences because they're discipling our children and our children watch them for more than two hours a day you must also just click there The other thing that they, they are doing, and that's coming back to the identity, is that they are curating an image. Um, you can be whoever you want to be on any platform at the same time. That is the truth that they're buying. Um, you are what you wear, what you listen to, what you watch, what you walk in. You are where you hang out, where you go to church, where you holiday, where you school. And none of that is our real identity, but that is to the youth of today, that is how they are curating identity for themselves. And then it's, I portray a different image of myself online. 37% of them said that. There is a huge blurring between what is true and what's a lie? There's a huge blurring between who I am, the true me, versus who I think I need to be to make it in the world. Um, and it's all about inclusivity. It's about gender inclusivity, race inclusivity, class inclusivity, mindset inclusivity. It's all about they bombard it with this. This is the narrative that they have. Um, and more woke... They're more woke than their parents or their guardians. Only 6% felt their parents were more aware of contemporary social issues. And I think we see that, is that we, we had um, a court, we, one quarter we spent with grade, third, um, grade sevens, 13 year olds, um, every Monday morning. And the first session we had with them is we, it was all about, we tried to land with them what is true, what is truth, and how do you judge what, what, what is, what's the truth. And um, the first thing we did is we asked them, what are the voices in, that you currently have in your life? So if you, if you draw a pie chart of, 
yourself in the middle, you have all these influences. So what are the voices that you're currently bombarded with and how do you, you know, how do you determine what is true? And 13 year olds. <laughs> so some of the voices were my body, my choice. Um, men are trash. <laughs> that's, that's what 13 year olds are, are feeding back to us. Um, all the social media hashtags that we see and we brush over, and some of us as parents aren't even aware of those conversations, were what those kids were feeding back to us. Um, the one was, get me a sandwich. So that's, you know, that is the, the gender sort of pushback that's happening at the moment. Um, toxic masculinity. The are words that 13-year-olds are feeding back to us. Um, that I can wear whatever I like and um, men should just behave. That's what 13-year-olds are saying. That's their truth. 70% of the youth say that they escape to sometimes to unhealthy things to cope. And that's why I'm going to hand over to Carl, because I think what we've seen is just the biggest escape for these, these kids. It's easy nowadays to escape. And they don't have to sit and be confronted with the truth. They can go to a social media feed. They, and also, your social media feed gets curated to the things that you've shown an interest in. So their worldview becomes really narrow. There's no other influence you know, in terms of their feed, because I showed that I'm interested in um, transgender topics, my entire feed will be bombarded with pro-transgender topics. So their worldview becomes really, really small. Um, and one of the things that, one of the biggest influences is in the area of hypersexuality, pornography, and we've just seen that. So Coral's gonna talk to you about probably the ugliest escape that our kids go to. Marvelous, thank you. So just quickly, I'm gonna try and run through this as, um, as quickly as we possibly can. For those of you who already know it, understanding pornography addiction, right? What we've got is, um, first of all, we need to understand the difference between your child being addicted and just between inappropriate behavior. So addiction is a state of being bound to a habit or practice, um, or to do something that is physiologically or physically habit-forming to such an extent that it causes trauma when you try to stop. It can also be any behavior or activity that is repeatedly engaged in and so used to avoid having to deal with the reality of life. So we, of we often talk about addicts self-medicating, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or pornography, people self-medicate because they are trying to deal with other issues in their lives. Inappropriate behavior, what, what is the difference? The difference is the frequency that they engage with it, the duration that they are on it or off it, or how long the program has, uh, how long the problem has persisted, or the intensity um, at which they engage in it, um, and the amount of risk that they will go to um, to get hold of their fix. So this was a top online aggregator site to publish their stats of how many visitors they get annually. So what picture I'm trying to paint for you, how prevalent is pornography on the internet? Um, there were 81 million daily average visits to this one site um, that published their stats, and this was published in 2017. Uh, they haven't published it since, not to my knowledge. We've searched, but these stats seem to be hard to come by. Um, they have over four million videos uploaded in 2017. If you watched every video from start to finish, it would take you 68 years to watch the they uploaded in one year. So that's the volume of content that is available on these aggregator sites. Um, how, how pornography sites have grown since 1998, so there were 14 million, and we now in 2022, roughly 4.5 billion pornography uh, pornographic sites out there, right? Um, um, just in terms of 42% of the users on the internet view pornography, 
35% of the websites on the internet is pornographic, and every 30 minutes, this is also, I don't know how relevant this is anymore if it's, if it's become more frequent, but every 30 min minutes a porn film is made, and every second there's 30,000 people watching pornography, which I'm sure is double, triple by now. Okay, there's a problem in the world with pornography. It's everywhere, it's everywhere. Um, is it a problem in South Africa? Do we have a problem with it? And the answer is, unfortunately, yes. South Africa, um, in, in the statistics that were published, South Africa was the top mobile device consumer of pornography in the world. Two things we can do well, we can play rugby, and we can watch porn on mobile devices. That's where we, we beat out the rest of the world. In terms of time spent per viewing, South Africa came in second in the world, um, and we're the 19th biggest mm. consumer in 2017. So I don't know in terms of our GDP where we stack, because I'm also not an economist, but I know we're not, we're not even 19th in the world or close to that. But pornography, we reign supreme. Average age of exposure, uh, we've seen in our groups the problematic ones are seven, they're about seven years. Average age of exposure, 11 years. 116,000 daily searches for child pornography. So if somebody is creating a demand for child pornography, searching for it, um, somebody needs to supply that demand somebody else, somewhere else in the world. So if, if, if there's a supply and demand. 90% of kids, and we, we can share um, the resources where we got these stats from, if anybody's interested. 90% of kids that were served, or um, of homes that were surveyed by kids um, up to the age of 18, or by the time they are 18, 90% of them will have had access um, will have viewed pornography, some by, by default or by choice or not by choice. And then 41% have made contact with dangerous or undesirable strangers, and 31% of them have sent or received messages with sexual content. So sexting is a real thing. Um, it's the way that our children engage now. And our parents, unfortunately, are in denial. 86% of these parents that were surveyed said their children never had a, my, not my child, <laughs> Um, and and that my child would had, have he has not seen anything bothersome online, or I don't think it was likely. And then 49% had uh, had never had a conversation about internet safety or uh, po you know anything pornographic. What will your children learn from? No, you've gone too far. I had one thing to do. <laughs> the, the presentation must be engaging. Yeah, well, she was... Fo <laughs> so he's focused. Okay, what will your children learn from pornography? So... Sorry? Oh, there we, you can see on the back there, Zoe. <laughs> so what will your children learn from pornography? The f so what these aggregators do is they aggregate the most popular things. So even in Google, uh, the, they'll give you the most popular information. It might not be the most peer-reviewed or most correct information, but e they'll even go for, you know, they'll even... So it's aggregated by popularity. And the 50 most popular films, 88% of them contained physical violence and 49% contained verbal aggression. Um, there's an average of 12 physical or verbal attacks per film and, and one, uh, one of them, uh, one particular disturbing scene managed to fit in 128 of these f physical or verbal attacks, um, you know, between the partners. So what are our children learning? 95% of the victims were either neutral to the abuse or appear to respond with pleasure. So our boys are learning that sex needs to be violent and our girls are, are learning that they should, it's okay, I should consent with that. Um, what we are also finding is, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So then, this was a quote by the US Department of Justice back in 2004, uh, but it's, and, and you can even, they even saw, red flagged it at that point saying, never before in the history of telecommunications media has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accessible to so many miners in so many homes with so few restrictions. So 
um, we advocate for a parenting, like a block on your Wi-Fi or a, uh, something on your app that you can actually monitor. You have to be in the conversation. You have to know what your child is viewing. Even if they slip up, it's an opportunity to have a discussion with your child and say, hey, wh why are you searching this stuff? Let's have a discussion about it. It's not a, uh, it's not a policing tool. It's a protection tool. We definitely advocate for that. If you've ever wondered, um, or if, you, if there was any argument for pornography being addictive or doing damage to your physiology, um, this is an absolute, yeah, I mean, this ca uh, closes the case for me. So on, on your left, um, the yellow brain, that's healthy brain function that they've mapped and monitored um, and tracked, right? The brain in the middle is a brain that's, that's addicted to pornography. You can see, especially around the middle of the brain, where the pleasure center is, it's completely worn out. Um, and there's, uh, what did I say? I said, okay, sorry, it's heroin. My helper is helping me. Thank you, Zay. And then um, the brain on the right is um, even worse, effect, uh, worse affected, but especially if you look at the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex has been worn away. And that's where the moral decision making, that's where um, that aspect of it sits. So, um, and you can see now why uh, somebody would escalate, but I'll get to that, um, and not have the moral understanding of what they are doing. If somebody you know, has, has been desensitized and escalates into molesting a child, you'd go, but what, what were you thinking? No, they weren't thinking. The moral decision making was canceled out by exposure to pornography. Okay, why is it so addictive? Because your brain is a reward center, it works, lots of chemicals involved, dopamine, endorphins, uh, but pornography both excites you and it also rewards you when, when, when you have gone through it. So now let's look at also just your device that you're on, your phone is made with addiction in mind, the platforms that we watch these things on that's made with addiction in mind, the content highly addictive, the act of you know, a, a sexual act tied to that of masturbation is um, with, you know, the reward at the end of that. Put all of that together in a sandwich. It is highly addictive in the way that it stacks up and um, enforces that behavior. Uh, why is it so addictive? Lots of chemicals involved in the brain. I'm not the neuroscientist uh, uh, here, but, and then it rewires your brain because of um, you know, this, it, it creates this new pathway where the brain says, well, this must be really important because I'm getting all my reward from this. Um, our brains have been, um, God designed it in such a way that we would do something and be positively enforced by the chemicals that we received. After doing, you, you receive this chemical release to say, good job, well done. So now if I'm getting that kick from pornography and from, from elsewhere, um, your brain is saying to you, good job, well done. So we are hijacking the brain, um, hijacking the pleasure center of the brain, hijacking the function of the brain, and your brain goes, oh, this must be very important, math not so much. So especially in our young children who have a immature prefrontal cortex, um, this is gonna affect them even more so because they can't discern between right and wrong, that's why they have parents, okay? They also have more mirror neurons, which make what they see more real. That's why your child cries when Lassie dies, but you're okay because you know it's an, a dog and they've taught the dog to lie down and play dead. Your child doesn't know the difference. So when they see people interacting on a screen, it is very real to them. Okay, another reason why pornography is so dangerous is because of the escalation. There is a, a, you, we get addicted to it. We escalate to more novel, to different, to more explicit stuff because the brain is wired for novelty. God didn't want us to sit in front of the same screen all day long. He wants us to see new things, meet new people, um, be fruitful and fill the earth. That was the first commandment. Now we are looking for more novel stuff. Your brain says, but I've seen this scene, the same scene that I saw last night. I'm seeing it again. Now nah, that's not good enough. Let me go and search deeper or let me go and watch more, let me go to more different, more explicit, more vile on the other side of the law, and then it gets really serious. Um, and now we get to a phase where we are desensitized, everything that we saw before that was shocking, that was perverted, that was wrong, it's okay, it's become acceptable, and eventually it gets to the point where we want to act out. Okay. Um, 
and in the end also stunts brain development. So there are a couple of studies around that as well. Complicates um, developmental and developmental tasks. It limits the capacity um, to regulate, to self-regulate. It continually overloads the brain circuitry and it causes damage and it stunts the right brain and starts to show signs of atrophy. So all your creative thought in your so it sits in the right brain is affected by that. So as a parent, how do we deal with all of this? So our, our children are exposed, they're vulnerable, you know, where do we position ourselves? And I think this is, as the first speaker said as well, you need to understand what is your position as a parent. And I think in, in the name of political correctness, um, we've allowed so many things into even into the church, into the body of Christ, because we go, well, you know what I do, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What happens outside of my house, that's not really my concern. The problem is that the other, the other half, they are concerned what is happening in your house, and they're trying very hard um, through every, every channel at their dispos the disposal to influence your child, whether it be Disney that have just been exposed now, with their work agenda, whether it be the superhero movies that our kids are watching, every single one of those things are aimed and geared at um, changing your child's worldview so that Jesus is not the superhero anymore. There's a whole array of superheroes that we can, we can look to. Um, yeah, that wasn't part of the plan, but I think it's, it's relevant. <laughs> so, Carl's tangent. So, uh, also then, so, Cultural Christianity versus followers of Jesus. Are we just, because we become cultural, there's this cultural Christianity where there's even some of these, um, the, these academics and scholars who go, you can be um, a, a non-believing Christian. So we, we grow up in this Christian society that have all these wonderful um, rules and, and, and things in place, this platform of respect for others and love and kindness and goodness. And, um, and as a result... Um, when something else comes in, we go, oh, we must be good, we must be kind, we must love our neighbor, and, and we allow these things into our society um, until later when, you know, now they are trying to actively take over our society and actually push us out. So it's, it's and especially in terms of the voices in your child's head, um, the stuff that he's being bombarded with. And it's not just from a Christian point of view. I don't know if you guys have seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix, so instead of watching a movie on Netflix, go watch The Social Dilemma. Um, and then they just talk about the, the, the volume of voices that are, you know, the half-truths that the children are confronted with. It's at a rate of six to one. So for every truth, there are six untruths that they are exposed to. And how does your child make sense of that? You have to bring them back to the objective moral truth, which is the Word of God. We have to bring them back to boys are boys and girls are girls. And because the Word of God said, I created man and woman, and yes, there are every other complication, but you know, if it's as simple as that, then it makes it simple for our children to understand as well. So in knowing your position, the question, who is teaching your child? Because the Word of God says, you shall teach them, um, to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Train up a child in the way that it should go, and when it is older, he will not depart from it. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. So we must be ready to give our children... Um, so we must be ready to, to help our children also develop their point of view. And it is having the conversation from, you know, like, hey, wonderful, you've, you've got a penis, hey, wonderful, you don't have, and that's the way we talk about it. And, you know, like, be, be open and be real about those things with your children. Um, so that it's absolutely modeling from, from the youngest age. Okay, so... Our question is, are you teaching your first disciple? Because they will be your... F we don't have to go out into Africa and make disciples or out into India and go and disciple people. Jesus has given you disciples in your home, and how are you discipling them? Are they going to walk out of your house as disciples of Christ, followers of Jesus? Or will they have some sort of moral paganism of a sort of a Christian worldview, like a 
loosey-goosey Christian worldview, or will they be very strong followers of Christ? And then, um, or are they being taught by social media and strangers? Right? So we want to challenge you to really go and research some of these topics and, and make it out for yourself where you stand on gender identity, where you stand on my body, my choice, where do you stand on abortion, where do you stand on modesty, what, what women can and cannot do, what men can and cannot do, where should we be? Feminism is something that's come along, um, along with communism and Marxism, this whole work agenda that comes from the left that we, you know, we're so respectful and we so, you know, in, because, you know, you wouldn't want to be found on the right, especially in South Africa, in terms of your political view or, you know, so you want to be as, as politically correct, especially in a country, country like South Africa, but in terms of a leftist worldview, this woke agenda that comes in that wants to destroy, destroy order, destroy a godly order, destroy a godly construct of what they call the patriarchy. But it it's really is a fight of good versus evil. It's really evil coming in to destroy anything and everything that was good. Okay, that's my rant. Uh, and then porn culture. Understand porn culture. Understand how it's influencing the way that your, the, the, the clothes that's in the store that your child is, that, that your daughter is trying on or that your daughter is going to want to buy. Understand how that's all been influenced by porn culture and what your view on it is. So that when you take a position, because if you are neutral, um, you're not going to win this war. Um, so Zoe's going to chat to us about the game plan. And I'll do the slide. Thank you. <laughs> Yo. I really failed in that department. I do apologize. So I think the first thing we're saying is you need to know. You need to be in the know. I think what we do very well as parents is we do the ostrich thing. And it's for many reasons. Not because we want to be bad parents. We're busy. We're busy and we, we've got math to focus on. We've got... You know, these, these academic stats that's in the picture, they are the easy, probably the easier things that's in the picture. These are the hard things. These are conversations that are happening outside of us. It's hard to be part of these conversations. But if we're not in it, we are losing the battle before it's even started. So the first thing is you have to be in the know. You need to know the conversations that your child is confronted with. We need to get comfortable with talking about these things. I never thought that I would have to talk to my child about some of the things that I had to talk to her about. It was very uncomfortable at the beginning. But when I realized, oh, this is playground chat. They talk about far worse things than what, you know, and if I'm not in there, that conversation is running away from me. So this, you have to be in the know, and you have to have a point of view. What we've just seen is that us as parents have not really thought about it. We haven't had time to think about it. We're not in that transgender thing because we're not necessarily confronted with it in the workplace. We're not in the gay conversation because we don't have, maybe, we're not confronted with that, or maybe we think it's not our problem yet. Um, so we don't have a point of view. Sometimes we don't even have a point of view on abortion. We haven't made it out for ourselves. Until you confront it with it, where your child is in a Christian school, and they have a conversation about abortion, and she's the only one in a Christian school that says that it's wrong. Her and the teacher, the only one in that classroom, the rest of them being discipled. They go, it's my body, my choice, and nobody will tell me that I cannot have an abortion. So we didn't think to have an abortion conversation with our child because it didn't come up. It didn't come up. We, we didn't think to go there. All of a sudden, you need to go, what's my point of view? What's my point of view in love? How do I break this point of view to my child? How do I have these conversations on a regular basis so that it doesn't come across as, I, because I said so? You know, because that's the other default behavior we have is because I said so. The Bible says it, it must be like that. 
Children don't take that. They don't, they don't, they don't, you know, we, I'll give you an example. Our daughter started to have, um, she started to listen to K-pop. So the Korean culture is very much part of teenage culture at the moment. Um, so, and she, all of a sudden, she wants posters of these K-pop artists on her wall and what have you. Every single boy in the band wears makeup and is quite effeminate, you know? So generally, you would go, oh, you know, it's just a phase. It's K-pop, you know, how bad can it be? We realized we need to just have a casual conversation and go, do you, because she would say, oh, mom, this boy is so attractive. And then you go, okay, what, what do you think makes him attractive? You know, he wears makeup. That's kind of strange. You know, in my days, men didn't wear makeup. Um, and she would go, yeah, but that, that's, not, that's not to say that he's, he only wears it on stage, you know, and it's not, it's not girly makeup. Um, and, then, and then she goes, you know, that is just my taste. And then you can talk to her about, but what influenced your taste? Have you had boys with makeup on your feed 24-7? It's going to influence what you find attractive. That's what you've been fed. Now you, have, now you have an opportunity to talk about what's the agenda in the world around masculinity. Masculinity is being attacked at the moment. Being a real man is not favorable in the world. It's been labeled as toxic. Girls are going, men are trash. When that movement breaks, every single hashtag on my daughter's Instagram is men, men are trash. So all of a sudden, we could have a conversation about that. We could go, it went from a K-pop poster to let's talk about what's the narrative in the world at the moment and how is that influencing your perception of what a man should be. And then you go, okay, what's God saying? What's God saying about what a real man is? Let's talk about that. Let's go to the objective. Let's go to the designer that designed men. And he had a blueprint for how, what a man should be. And then let's talk about that. And let's just get your principles right. That you don't, that, and I'm not, she's still listening to K-pop, I'm sure. Um, but we had the conversation that that's not necessarily what you should start to take as the ultimate godly man. So you need to be in the know and um, you need to have a point of view, and then you need to have a game plan. So um, we, all I'm saying is a plan doesn't have to be perfect, but at least have a plan. Have a, have a strategy of how you're gonna have these conversations with your child at what age. As parents, we need to work together. We need to go, okay, how are we gonna handle this? And we had many challenges where, um, you know, and you don't think about these things until they happen to you. So all of a sudden, there's a boyfriend on the, in the picture. Now you go, we, we know, we, we can see this boy is hypersexualized. What's your view on this and what's your game plan? Because, and we plotted the strategies. We went, okay, let's get practical. One is we can ban him from our house. <laughs> That's one, it's a strategy. And you might decide as parents, she's 16 years old or 15 years old, banning is gonna be our strategy. But you must know that banning will have consequences, that she might rebel, then you need to have a, a risk mitigating strategy for that, okay? <laughs> there might be other things that pop out the woodwork. She might start to lie she might start to, to sneak away. So we went, we went like, okay, banning option. Okay, this could potentially happen. She's in school with him. She's at youth with him. Okay, so banning is not an option. Okay, <laughs> so what's our plan B? What's our plan C? All I'm saying is have a plan. Don't think that it's just going to go away. He's going to be around. <laughs> and it's 
Then I think you need to understand your role within this. What stance are you going to take? And, and then be prepared to pivot. Like, be prepared to make, make um, you know, changes to your plan. The other thing that I would say is be very clear very early on. When your child's two, four, six, when they're little, have a plan now as to when are you going to give them their, their first phone. Go look at what the dangers are around that. In fact, go do your research and then decide when are you going to give them their first phone. Then decide up front what rules you're going to have around that and don't break your own rules. Because once you've given it with no rules, after that, after the fact, it's really hard. So boundaries up front. Go away today and go figure out when you are prepared to give your child a phone. Decide how you're going to manage that and be prepared to take it away when it doesn't work. So I'll tell you what we did, because we, luckily, we went through our journey before Lisa hit the age where she wanted a phone. But we knew we're not going to give her a phone. We're going to stretch it as far as we can. So that was our strategy. Then we said, okay, we're going to give you a phone, but this comes with responsibility. So here are the rules. Responsibility and accountability. So, if we see that you cannot manage your time on this phone, we will have to manage it for you. So we're going to give you a little bit of rope. If you hang yourself, game over. Then we, we say to her, um, we're going to let you make certain choices, but if those choices are dangerous, then we're going to step in. So we, she always knew that we're going to step in. Also said to her, I will always know the password to your phone, and I must be able to pick up your phone at any given time and look at it. Easier said than done, because you do feel like a terrible person to go, come, let me have a look. She wanted Instagram. She's an artist. She wanted to put all her art up on Instagram. I said to her, the only, um, the only way you can have Instagram is if I have access to your Instagram. Best decision I've ever made. I have helped my child through a very, very tough thing because I had access. I see some of the children on Instagram that's in her class, and I want to cry because the mom and the dad's not part of that child's journey that she's going through. They've got no idea. They can't see how she is actually falling off the rails and I can see it firsthand. So I say, be on your child's Instagram. There came a time when she was like, this is so hard for me, but she's accountable. There's an adult that is watching her. And I say to her, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shout at you when you make a wrong mistake. We're gonna have a conversation. Eight, nine months in, she sat when the when the um the problem was removed. She said, she said to me, Mom, now for the she said to me, I just want to say thank you. I want to thank you because I didn't know how to identify the toxicness of this relationship. I didn't see the dangers. But I learned. I learned and you were there. You were there to catch me, to cry with me, to hold me to guide me, to pray with me. There was someone there, an adult, who could help. A lot of these kids don't have an adult. They're in that conversation. They don't know what to do with it. They feel stuck, and, and there's no adult to help them. Um, yeah, I just wanna, if you can go back to... Um, yeah, so, so I, would, I would just encourage you to decide what your boundaries are. And it's hard. We had, I'll be honest with you, we had fights about boundaries. Because sometimes I would go give some rope, and Carl's like, no, we can't give rope. We can't, you know. I've also had times when I was like, no, I think we need to give her space. And Carl said, okay, okay, we'll give her space. And then it goes wrong, and then I go like, oh! 
why didn't I listen to Carl? He had the gut feel that we shouldn't have given her the space, you know? So just work together and, and decide. And be very clear about it. Don't be wishy-washy. If it's two hours a day, stick to two hours a day. If it's, you can have it with, if I have access to the password, stick to it. Just make those rules. Don't wait for it to, to run away with you. So I'm going to leave you with that. And then the last thing is what we've just seen is relationship. Relationship is everything. And this was a big learning for us. And we actually went to another talk and we learn from every talk that we go to because there are other speakers that are, that are just so, so, so good at these talks. And, and there was a specific um, just talk around parenting styles. And that really helped us tremendously when we understood that sometimes we have um, the, wrong, the wrong parenting, parenting approach. And, um, and, and it just shows you that parenting is, uh, it's, it's really, sorry, I just want to pull this up. Parenting is really um, a learning curve for all of us. None of us have done it before. If you think about it, it's like we're in a job that we're not qualified for. It's not like we had a test run. You know, it's like you get thrown into it and you have to figure it out along the way. So there are four, more or less four parenting styles. And three of the parenting styles really create children's, children with a high propensity for addiction. Um, and that is the authoritarian. So it's that guy in the... So it's, it's very, it's, it's high control. Carl's authoritarian. Really, really well Yeah, <laughs> so it's strict, you've got high expectations, you give orders, you reject, you control, you're unsupportive. That is a, um, authoritarian. You are the authority in the house, you've got high levels of control, levels of warmth and, and affection. So that child will follow you because they're scared, not because there's a relationship. And the minute that they have free reign, I promise you they're going to do the opposite of what you told them to do. Then you have uninvolved parents. Uninvolved parents, I mean, it's uninvolved, rejecting, neglecting, self-absorbed, no boundaries. And it, uninvolved parents are generally your very, very busy parents, outsourced parents. Um, it, is the, it is very prevalent in this day and age. Because to, in order to, to have the lifestyles that we, that we want, in order to stay in that house and the estate, drive that 1.5 million rand car, you're going to have to sell your soul to some corporation. You're going to be busy. So you're going to have to outsource some of the parenting, which means that you're uninvolved. Then there's permissive parenting. So there's the parenting where I'm going to be your friend if I'm friendly with you, if I'm with you, if I'm rocking it out with you, gosh, we're going to have a good time, and you're going to love me, and you're going to do everything that I tell you to do, and you're going to be an obedient child. So you're very affectionate. You might be very nurturing. You might be a little bit indulgent, but no control. It's like, you know what? I did it when I was young. Let the kids be kids. It's just a phase. Oh, they're having such a good time. No, they're throwing back tequilas at the age of 16. It's a problem. <laughs> um, so you give in. You don't have curfews. You have, you're inconsistent. You don't have boundaries. It's pro problematic parenting. And we have to put hand on heart and say, look, am I a little bit permissive in the wrong areas, you know? Um, so I think what we tend to do is we flip-flop between permissive, then it goes wrong, then we become authoritarian. We're like, no, I'm going to put this boundary, and you will, you ground it for life, um, <laughs> which is also not helpful. So um, where we have to aim for is high warmth and high control. So that is where we say we are authoritative. Um, <laughs> Boundaries, expectations, responsive, accepting, open communication, and discipline. They did a study um, where they put children in um, a field with no um, fence around it, and they all huddled in the middle. Nobody explored. There was no boundary. 
and they meant put the fence around it, they explored right up until the fence. So it's so important that we put boundaries in place that we have healthy boundaries for our children, but also don't make them so rigid <laughs> that we have to be able to, to change because we all still learning. Our child's an individual. Our child's got, got you know, a different, specific personalities. We had to figure that out, and we're still figuring it out. And with every developmental stage, it sort of changes. And then you're like, oh, now we're dealing with something different here, so we're going to have to pivot. So we want to leave you with this, is that don't remove yourself out of the conversation. Be in the conversation. Know what's the temperature on the ground. Understand what the youth is talking about. Learn to have those conversations um, in the right manner and have a game plan and build a relationship. Relationship is everything. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just as we're closing off, can I ask you to speak to us about two other things, please? Um, I, I know as a church, Ross, um, you can maybe just tell everybody as well. You've got, oh, is this the line for the video? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I didn't click. <laughs> um, so uh, as a church as well, you have a very good... Um, uh, pornography addiction program that you also run. Uh, Carl and Zoe here uh, also run a similar program like that. We've spoken about it before. The I, Me movement that speaks to different areas of addiction. If you could just quickly, just two minutes, give us an insight onto that. And then also, just practically, most of you will be aware of different ways of um, having programs on your phones, between phones as a family. You also have a particular one uh, that you can make available. Just tell us about Custodio as well. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so if you, uh, our web address is imemovement.co.za. So ime is all about accountability. So ime, it's a ripoff of the iPhone because it's the digital generation. I need to, to spell all of that out for you. But so imemovement.co.za. Um, and we deal with digital addiction, but there's also, you know, gaming addiction is sort of a gateway drug, and all the parents will say, no, but my child's just, at least he's not hanging out in the mall and doing drugs. He is doing a drug in your, it's, it's on your sofa. Um, and it's not teaching him all that he needs. So we, um, there are some resources on the page. Um, another valuable resource for parents is commonsensemedia.org. Um, if you guys want to take a look at that. And the other um, organization that we work with closely is uh, case-sa.org. Um, they also have wonderful books, um, parenting books, and how do you talk to children about pornography, especially to the younger ones. You talk about good pictures, bad pictures. You don't talk about pornography. You don't use words and terms that they don't already know or understand or come to you with. So you, you address it on their level of understanding, especially for those of you with younger kids. Um, but yeah, so we've, the IME movement, um, we have talks at schools, um, we have talks such as these, and then we also have recovery groups. We have a recovery program, we've been running that with, uh, with adults now online, um, and then with younger kids in person, if it is within our vicinity and it is possible for us to all make it to the same venue. Um, and that's a 12-week, 90-day program. We also have a software called um, that we we've bought purchased a whole lot of licenses that you can buy for 700 rand a license that covers you for five devices for a whole year. So if you work it out, it's like 11 rand a month for your device. Your data will cost you more. So it's called Custodio, and it's on our website you, at on the IME Movement There's Custodio. It's designed for parents to be able to monitor what your child is seeing online, but you can also even set uh, the amount of time that they are allowed to access the internet. W you know, what time of day are they allowed to access the internet? Um, because wonderful good parents that we are, we switch off the light and say good night, and we go to bed, and our, our children sit till the wee hours of the morning on the internet, and they have access to the whole wide web, and we, we think they are innocent, and they will not find themselves in dark places, but they do. So we need to be able to
That's, and it's part of that conversation of saying, look, you are at an age where you are allowed two hours of screen time per day. We're gonna, your phone will be accessible for that. For that time only, you'll be able to have one hour of internet access. And you can block the sites, or they're already blocked, pornography is already blocked, but you can block specific sites if you see that there, are, that there is problematic behaviors involved in that. Um, and, you know, we go, oh, I'm going to take my child's phone away. It's going to be so, you know, what are they going to do? They go, they play for two hours on the phone. If the phone switches off, they go, oh, it's off. They put it down and they go and play outside. They do something else with their time. It is we have trained them to be addicted and to, um, you know, or we've allowed them to become addicted to the device. The boredom is a very good thing. Um, or the a child psychologist will tell you that. It's very good for us to be bored because it stimulates creative thought. We stimulate creative juices and we do things. We find new things to do with our time that is valuable. I think just um, a quick overview of our program. Um, it's 90 days because it takes about 90 days for the, the brain to be rewired. But it's, it can be a much longer walk for, for some, depending on how how entrenched the habits and the patterns are. Um, but we, we've, we've stuck to, to 90 days, which is really a good, good start. Um, and we start off by the, we call it the no, grow, go um, sort of format. We, you start off by just understanding what has happened to you. What, what, is, the, what is your current addictive bat patterns? What are the things that makes you run to this? When do you go to it most? To, to really get that self-awareness of what has happened to me, how addictive am I, um, what's my, my addictive cycle, etc. And then we go into um, the, the grow part is really to start to see, because pornography is not the problem, it's what's What's driving you there? So that's a, a very sort of deep part of the, of the program is really to get to the heart of why do I run there? It's your negative core beliefs. And this is where we start to see a lot of the, you know, the deep-seated stuff pops out of the woodworks is that I'm actually not happy with myself. There are certain, I've got self-esteem issues, I've got identity issues, I've got daddy issues, I've got mommy issues. All those things sort of pop out the, at the woodwork. Um, and then we deal with that. And then lastly, the last session is where we future-proof. We go into future-proofing. So what are you going to do the day the 90 days are over? What's going to be your new pattern, your purpose, trying to find your purpose in life, trying to find those things that's going to keep you out of addiction, that's going to build your identity so that you don't fall back into it. So that's sort of the format of the, of the program. Um, and it's, it's been, we've had amazing testimonies. Some people had to come back three times because the journey is just their journey. Um, so we also are very patient with that because we know that, um, you know, if, if there was a silver bullet and a 90 minute, um, you know, pocket, pocket recovery group, we would have given it to you, but it's, it's unfortunately not. Thank you. I thought your talk would uh, prevent our children from ever having problems, so uh, <laughs> I. <laughs> but they say that you'll know the truth, then you'll be miserable, and then you might be set free. No. Yes. Yeah, it's great. Thank you so much, Coral. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, at least we know that where you live, and uh, it's close, and we can have a relationship with you. But thank you also for inviting us to your information and your programs online. Thank you. Let's take a five-minute leg stretch, and uh, then we'll have time for... Nicola Diacher, thank you. So, um, the friend that I'm going to introduce today, I've known Nicola. Nicola, that is lunk, ne? That is bye bye lunk. It's more than 20 years that I've known you. But uh, they were elders in the church that uh, we planted together in Pretoria, lunk, lunk, Galera, just after the turn of the century. You know, just you remember the millennium where we were afraid that all the electronic devices will go dark and the world will go dark. It would have been a good thing. <laughs> So it's great. Um, but uh, Nicola Diacher, Nicola and Philip, uh, she's a lecturer in Stellenbosch University in political science. Uh, she is really bright, um, but she's also a nice person. You know, some professors are just bright, but they're not nice, but she's also nice. She has two beautiful boys that are teenagers and that are older now. And um, 
the reason why she is involved in these talks is, is from a political perspective, but background, but also when it comes to parenting, because uh, she'll talk about it, but some issues that they've had in their school where she is on the governing board of the school. So I would like to welcome Nicola. I'm going to pray with you, Nicola. And um, yeah, thank you for, for talking to us, because this is not just a home issue. The kids are also going to schools. So Father, we thank you for Nicola. We thank you for Philip. Thank you for years of faithfulness, God, of of building godly community and looking at power and community structures, God. So we thank you for wisdom, and we thank you for the grace of a mother who speaks to us, and we pray that you will help us, God, to, not, to be aware of the powers and the opportunities and the responsibilities given to us as parents in a community. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Ross. Um, I reflect with some of my friends. I mean, you make me sound really old. I just want to say that. <laughs> All these years. But um, there's something beautiful also about getting older. I'm not going to say old. I'm not ready for that. Older is that when you reflect with your friends, you can reflect the years, you know, and, and where we come from. And there were children. And before that, there weren't children. And before that, we weren't married. And then we were married. And we've gone through this. And it's really precious to have such precious memories with friends and moments and, and experiences and journeys. And, you know, so it, it, that for me is really precious. Um, so thanks, Ross. And greetings to Magrit. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for familiar faces. It's nice to see the familiar faces. Um, I have to say that Carl and Zoe undid me. I, was, I wasn't too sure how I was going to get up here and talk. I mean, I'm like, you know, and then th there's that kind of that, you know, I'm, I'm crying, but at the same moment, I'm like, just let me out of here. Who must I fight? <laughs> you know, that, that mama in me. I've got two beautiful teenage boys, and I'm just like, just let me at them. <laughs> let me at them. <laughs> Give them to me. I'm going to go for them. Um, you know, it's just, it's really challenging to think what our kids have to face and the world that they find themselves in today. So I want to start with this one. Not this one, is it? Is it on? Do I have to turn it on? Um, where do I press point? Oh, okay, great. So I want to wanted to show you. Start with this one, um, uh, to show that we do family. Um, and not only do we do it, we love it. It's wonderful. It's awesome. So at the top, um, that's probably more, a more recent photo. That is my husband in the front. That's Philip. And those are our two really gorgeous boys. Um, so I, I'm raising, I, I trust, good, solid men. Shame my, my, my eldest. Oh, my goodness. I know that he's going to, you know, when he finds the right woman, because he... At the moment, girls are still like this. He likes them, but they're very strange beings. But he also, he comes to me and he goes, Mommy, they go to like when they go out and, and he sees, and he goes, Mommy, they don't, they don't wear, they wear scoots. He says, they wear shirts. And, and I just want to say that it impresses him nothing. He doesn't like it. He really doesn't like it. So he actually likes, he, so, so when that girl gonna, is going to come along, um, and she's, oh my goodness, shame, she's got a lot of things that she's going to have to <laughs> be. But um, I know he's going to fall, but it's going to be one woman, and he's going to see her, and she's going to fall. My other one, um, he's gorgeous, um, and he has um, multiple girlfriends, and he he understands the girls, and the girls understand him. He's completely different. He's very loving, so I've also got to give him as much love. He's tactile, so I've got to give him lots of love so he gets enough of that from me that he's not looking for it from the others yet. So my eldest is almost 16. My youngest is almost 13. They're teenagers. Um, maybe boys are different, but I love the teenage stage. They are super. I enjoy them very much. So that's also my husband's mother, so that's we involved in terms of generational with having um, family around us. We're very grateful that we can do it. I know it's not always possible. So they have very involved grandparents, um, so involved that we actually bought a property together with my parents, um, and we now do dual living. So my parents live, um, they're uh, built onto us. It's not perfect. 
um, but they are wonderful, and the, the kids love it. So they love um, their, 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 their grandparents. So in the middle picture, there's my mom and my dad. Oh, you see, they've made me emotional. And, and that's my greatest advantage, is those two people. Obviously, it's the Lord, first and foremost. But they set me up, and because they loved each other, and they loved us. And um, oh, my dad, he's, he always said to me, I'm going to be Miss South Africa. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> it never occurred to me that I would not be Miss South Africa, that my legs were not going to be long enough for Miss South Africa. I just thought, yeah, he's, my dad said that I'm going to be Miss South Africa. Um, and then there's my brother, and then, then my brother and his family lives close by, and so they also get to, to know their cousins, which is also an enormous blessing. So um, my son, my eldest son, and their son um, was born on exactly the same day, so they're exactly the same age. Um, so we, yeah, so we get together, we do family, we, we love family, we love having everybody around, and I want to say this is incredible blessing, and this is what God intended for us in terms of the joy, and this is one of the things that this world is coming at hard and fast, because it knows how powerful this thing is. Um, I want to also say that, so this is my brother in the front there, my brother's four years older than me. And I think if I had grown up in this day and age, I wonder what, I mean, I'm grateful for my parents, and I think they would have steered me, but at that stage, when I was young, I was, is, is a Tom girl the right word? Isn't it not tomboy? Like, you, you're a tomboy, I don't know. So I, I was very tomboyish, um, I, I had short hair, I wore shorts, I loved adventure, I looked at my brother and I thought, that's, he's so cool just want to be like my brother. I just want to do what he does. Um, the, my parents asked if I wanted to go brownies, and I'm like, no, they wear those really ugly uniforms. I, and that's why I didn't want to do brownies, because they, they wore those ugly <laughs> uniforms. But my brother went to scouts, and I'm like, I don't want to go to brownies, I want to go to scouts. They do fun things. And so I would adventure, and you know, in this day and age, somebody would have probably said, oh my goodness, she really wants a boy a boy. I, I never wanted to be a boy. I just wanted to do the cool things my brother did. And, um, and I do now. I have a, um, a, 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 a husband who's a real manly man, and um, we hike, and I trail run, and we go away for weekends, and we get out in the bush and in nature, and I love adventuring. Um, and so we have, we have a good time. And I want to also just remind us, we actually have to have good times with our families. Okay, so let's get to the hard stuff. Um, as Ross said, I am, I'm, I'm an academic, and I've been trying to sort through these things and unravel them. So mine is going to be a little bit more into the, you know, the philosophical side of what's going on. Um, where do you find the roots? And um, as I sometimes say, I come from the social sciences. I come from the dark side. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't have to be like that either. So, um, so I want to start with understanding the times that we live in, and I want to put forward, and obviously there's, uh, it's never, it's not perfectly so like this, and, and there's always different worldviews inside of these predominant um, worldviews. So from the 16th century, we see the, the Reformation, so this is obviously Martin Luther, who uh, nails the 95 Theses onto, onto, the, onto the church door in 1517, and and it really sets off a momentum in not just amongst Christians, but into the world. And um, so we find out, or he reminds us that we are saved by faith and not by works. It's a reminder that there is a God, we are not him, and the religious leader is not him either. So it ushers in the ideas of supernaturalism. There's a natural and the supernatural, God as creator and designer of the natural. So we will expect order and structure and design and that things function a certain way because there is a designer. And maybe I should say this um, from the outset, because there is a designer, we should go to him for how do we operate 
we don't actually get to self-define. So, and also to remind our kids, what does your designer say? You don't get to self-define. Um, and what this period of time actually did is that it ushered in a time of flourishing. So yes, there were the 30 years war between the Protestants and the Catholics, and they eventually exhausted each other out, and they came to the, fine, I, we agree to disagree, and um, actually came religious freedom. So with that religious freedom, started to bring the flourishing of other freedoms, and eventually the recognition of the innate value of every human being, and that was actually born because we are all created in the image of God. Every person is individually valuable. And so you started to get your um, international human rights. Um, and then it moved into the political system. And you actually got your liberal democracy because you couldn't have state structures starting to intrude into especially the civil area. So your initial forms of democracy, what we would call a protective democracy, was actually initially a response against... Um, those who were in power, monarchies, kings, who were actually intruding into personal lives. And it was a push back. So it was like saying, no, you go back there. And it was starting to opening up of civil liberties and personal and private liberties. We are in a very different world at the moment in terms of our relationship with the state. So that's where we're going to get to. So it was an imperfect time, but in general, we saw economic growth before this Poverty was the norm. For the first time, actual access to socioeconomic benefits started to become democratized. More people had access to it. Um, then we move into the Enlightenment, the 17th century. Um, so obviously, it's quite a bit of crossover. See, 1685 to 1815, secular humanism arrives. So it's science, rationalism, logic, truth can be known. Um, the difference with this is we, the first one was supernaturalism, that God, from God comes the natural order. This time they said, no, well, thanks very much. We're going to leave God out of it, and we'll put ourselves on the throne. So this is a period of, of just the natural and naturalism. Everything is natural, but now the human is on the throne. Um, so there is a recognition, and obviously, especially in the academic environment, I, I come into contact with secular humanists. And um, it's interesting, when I did a talk, my husband and I, we actually did a paper on the influence of Protestantism in terms of democratic development um, in sub-Saharan Africa and good governors. And when I show them this, this picture of how Protestantism is declining in the West and it's increasing into Africa, Latin America, and I get all excited about it because... I expect that this is going to have a ripple effect in the other aspects of society. They look at that and they go, oh my goodness. That they see what's happening in Europe as positive because it's a secularist theory, this idea that the, the, more, the more you know, the more you progress and you're going to grow out of your religion. And so they kind of see us as a little bit of unevolved, you know, that we kind of tolerate it. So I get this kind of like condescending, you know, tolerance, but like, oh, she's really misreading that picture, isn't she? Whereas, <laughs> and, and they just seeing this as, no, well, Africa is, and I'm just thinking, I'm seeing the light is coming to us, and they just think, no, we're, ne we're not going anywhere. And I'm just thinking, sure, I'm so glad I live here and not there anymore. Um, so, so they kind of, there's a place of, of like this mutual like tolerance because they recognize the Christian roots, their Christian roots, but they've denied them. So they recognize it. So there's this kind of mutual tolerance and agreeing to disagree. But now we're into a different phase. And this is a little bit what Reitzer touched on. It's a little bit what Zoe and Carl touched on. But we're in, I would argue, the postmodernist era. And it's ushering in the paganism, okay? And um, it's so interesting for me because often in these things they will say, and I see it in my school governing body when we're sitting around and they go, well, you really should get with the times. These are the new things and you need to embrace the new times. And I keep on thinking, they're not new, they're old. This kind of way of living, the sexualizing of society, this um, the boundary, boundary list is not new. You can go back to the Roman society, and this is actually just a return to those ways of, of living. Um, so it's a broad skepticism, postmodernism, 
subjectivism, and relativism. It's a general suspicion of reason. It's a return to mysticism and paganism. And so it's a return to Greek and Roman religions and traditional religions. It's actually for us a very hostile environment. It's not just hostile for us, it's hostile for the secular humanist because remember postmodernism is a response to modernism. It's a rejection of reality, it's a rejection of tests of truth, it's a rejection of objectivity, it's a rejection of science, rationality, and logic. And um, so what we're actually finding is a lot of the literature that I'm also reading around is, is, is these classical liberals or secular humanists who are looking at this and I'm going, oh my goodness, this is the end of biology, this is the end of science, the end of maths. Um, so any of you have read um, Dr. James Lindsay, he writes, started a whole, it's really worthwhile looking at, uh, New Discourses, he wrote a book that I have here called Cynical Theories, but he comes from a maths background, and um, he's not necessarily a Christian, and he's reading these signs, and he's like, oh, this is, you know, it will be the end of maths, and etc. So I want to encourage you with a scripture, Colossians 2, verses 2 to 8. Before I do that, I really enjoy Paul's letters because um, it's encouragement to the church in similar environments. As I said, we are moving, I think, back into a more pagan environment, and this was the environment which the early church found itself in. So I find his letters to be encouraging and relevant to where we are today. So um, he was dealing with heresy and false teaching. There was syncretism with the Greek philosophy, the Jewish legalism, and mysticism that was coming into the church. So it was this early form of Gnosticism that Jesus was merely one of the semi-divine beings. So he can be part of, but he's not the only one. So in chapter 2, Paul instructs the believers in the truth and alerts them to the danger of returning to pagan vices. So as I said, this is a time in which we find ourselves in. And just a reminder of what is heresy. Heresy is to choose for oneself. And a heretic is one who places their choice and opinion above the authority of God. So Colossians 2 verses 28, when I was, uh, two, uh, two to eight, when I was um, an early, in my early life, when I started off in the academia and um, I sat in these tables and everybody used these very big words and I had no idea what anybody else was saying. And I was incredibly, incredibly intimidated by it. And I remember fleeing to my room. Um, we were at a conference. And I remember going to the Lord, I, do, I don't know if I should be here. I don't think I should be here. And are you really sure I should be here? And um, he gave me Colossians 2. In order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Just there. Why would I worry? In Christ, in Jesus, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by the fine-sounding arguments. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Isn't that also something that we see so little of today? Thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So there were two things for me. The one was clearly get rooted in Christ, get rooted in his word. And that's what I did. I read his word and I started to say, okay, what does governance look like? What does it look like in accordance with your word? What, is, what, is, what does your word say about it? So I've read... Over the years, and, and every time, I'm still learning. We're always still learning. Um, just quickly, my, my son is a chrapkas, so he thinks he's very funny. And he said to me, Mommy, you know, you must, you must actually employ a teenager. He says, well, they still know everything. <laughs> so as you get older, you realize you don't know everything. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm learning all along and I'm enormously grateful. Um, and then there was a second thing in here, and that was uh, don't be deceived. 
And it says it twice, do not be deceived, do not be deceived. And so our instruction is to be rooted in him and don't be deceived because they're going to be fine sounding, but they're going to be hollow and they're going to be deceptive and they're going to be dependent on human tradition and the elemental forces of this world. Okay. So, in my attempts to kind of unravel and try and understand what is going on, a couple of years ago, um, I think it was about, it was before COVID and lockdown, so maybe 2018, um, I went to uh, Oxford, um, it was a real privilege, and I went to an academic freedom conference, and where people went to go and share on what was happening inside the academia. And um, which was interesting, we had an, a conference on academic freedom which we had to keep closed because we were worried it was going to be disrupted. Um, and that's kind of the reality of what's happening and in, inside the academia. Okay, so what are these ideological roots? Um, the previous speakers have touched on this, so I want to kind of start scratching away a little bit there. Um, two kind of... I think founts, one is postmodernism and the other one is a Frankfurt School slash Marxism. I do think uh, the term cultural Marxism, I'm going to get to it, is perhaps the more better description. But what, uh, what has happened is that they've called it, um, that on those on that side saying this is a pejorative that the conservatives use. So they've tried to undermine it. So I, I'm, I'm nervous to use it because I don't want to undermine myself when I write, uh, when I speak about it and people shut down. But we'll, we'll get to it. So, okay, so first, Postmodernism. Postmodernism, we see three phases. It's recent, so 1960s, 1990s is a response to modernism. It's deconstructivist, it's skeptical, it's in literature. Um, again, this is coming out of your social scientists, out of your arts, that environment. It's a reaction against this ordered view of the world. They reject that there is objective natural reality. They reject the descriptive and explanatory statements of scientists and that historians, historians can, in principle, be objectively true or false. They reject reason and knowledge. They say there's no such thing as human nature, but rather human psychology has been socially engineered. This is what Rachel was saying, so everything's been socially engineered. There's no objective reality and that all is relative. Rather, knowledge is a construct of power and society is made up of power constructs that need to be deconstructed. So it's very skeptical, it wants to deconstruct, but then we move into phase two. Phase two, 1990s to 2010, we move into what's called the applied or activist postmodernist. It fragments, or it doesn't really fragment, or it has, it, um, has different offshoots, uh, queer theory, critical race theory, fat studies, gender theory, etc. And so what is happening, and they're still keeping within certain academic uh, spheres and in terms of um, activist circles. They want to now start reconstructing society, so once they've deconstructed, to reconstruct, and then it's, but it's specifically applied to these academic fields and to these activist circles. But they start talking to each other in this language to such a point that we move into the phase three, and this comes out of um, James Lindsay. This is 2010 off onwards, where he speaks about it becoming the reification, and this kind of just made so much sense to me when I, when I read this, and this is, reification means it's made real. So it starts skeptical, it becomes activist, and then it's made real. So it's the point of departure. It's not under discussion anymore, it is. So that's where they move. They move from the place of this is. So they say their principles are now the known knowns. We don't need to discuss it. We don't need to research it, investigate it, look for the claims, look for the evidence. We know it. These are the known knowns. Thus, society is structured of specifically identity-based systems of power and privilege that construct knowledge. Okay, I'm going to get to more. So that's the one side. The other side is the Frankfurt School um, and the Marxism. So it starts with, 
Antonio Gramsci, that doesn't just start, it obviously starts with Karl Marx, but then into Antonio Gramsci, um, where he views churches, charities, the media, and schools as organizations that need to be invaded by socialist thinking. So what happened is we, um, just before, well, into the World War I and then to World War II, um, prior to that, you got the Russian Revolution, and remember the whole point of Marxism is to create this utopia, this classless society, where everybody's equal, um, nobody owns anything, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, if you've heard that one recently. Um, so everyone is classless, and the way you need to do this is you need the proletariat, you need your working class to rise up and overthrow the landowners, the bourgeoisie, and when their class of society is established, everybody's going to be happy, because we'll all be equal. And it didn't happen when World War I and World War II came, because there was the expectation, okay, this is the right moment for the working class to come and rise up against the, the bourgeoisie, and it didn't happen. And so what happened, especially, um, so with, with European countries, so especially Britain, Everybody rallied, became patriotic, rallied together, and they fought a common enemy, irrespective of their classes. So they looked at this, and they were like the communist scholars, and they looked at this and said, well, what happened here? And they said, okay, there's something that happened. There's, a, there's civil society that rallies together. There's this underlying value of a family that rallies together, that there's these associations, and they work together um, this is where the problem is. These are the institutions that are upholding the system, and we're not going to get the ideal until we unravel this. And so is born cultural Marxism. And so the idea is a war of position. So this is Gramsci's idea. Um, and it's the equivalent of trench warfare. So you don't go full frontal. So with the Russian Revolution, that was full frontal. You go straight for the state. They didn't have these other civic associations. But with, with now in the Western world, you have to go for these civic associations. So you've got to go trench warfare. You go underground. And you start seeping into all of these institutions. So a student of Gramsci calls this the long march through the institutions. So... What are these institutions in particular? And I want you to remember this is, the, is to go into the so-called private spheres. So to use the public into the private, and we'll, we'll have a look at that. So we're talking about churches, charities, media, schools, universities, and the economic and corporate environment. So they, then with this moves into the Frankfurt School, and, um, and these things come together, and this postmodernism and this cultural Marxism come together and we see today what is called critical theory. Sometimes also just called theory, and sometimes called social justice, and sometimes called wokeism, okay? Please also ask people for their definitions because sometimes people mean something very different when they say a word. So just say, well, what, do you, what do you mean by, what do you mean by that? So we can just have clarity around it. So the critical theory is that this is a way of seeing the world, um, and they understand it in terms of two primary claims. The first claim is that everybody can be divided into two groups, those who have power and those who don't have power. The second claim is that those who have power always oppress those who don't have power. So two claims. Um, so the oppressors are those with power, and the oppressed are those without power. But how do we know who these oppressed are and who the oppressors are? Don't worry, the critical theorists tell us. Sorry? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what are, the, what are these groupings? It's based on group identity. Race, class, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical ability, age, weight. We also discussed between race and I was probably height. I, I get a tick on that one. And many, and many other classifications. Um, the degree to which you are oppressed determines your moral authority. I want to say that critical theory is not consistent with Christianity. 
So critical theory offers a different view of humanity. It says that our identity and therefore our value is measured in terms of social categories. Race, gender, social status. Your identity is according to those social categories. But the Bible says we are all created in the image of God. It says that our identity is rooted in our creator. And I love that scripture which writes the shared with about that actually it's not about the flesh because we are created in Christ Jesus, a new creation. Our identity is rooted in our creator and he determines our identity. The other problem with critical theory is that it offers a different view of sin. So it's sin is just about oppression. Yes, it is part of it, but it is a, not the. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is the fact that we don't have access to our creator. Sin is the fact that we miss the mark, we're not holy, we're not pure. Sin is the fact that we need a savior. And that Jesus Christ is the one that offers us that access by forgiving us of our sin. Because critical theory gives the prop, gets the problem wrong, it also gets the solution wrong. So as I said, because we are all equally sinful, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, no, not one of us is good, our salvation can only be found through Jesus, and it's through repentance of sin. And the problem, the critical theory says that only oppressors are guilty, while the oppressed are not. So I just want to quickly go back to this, and what is this fed into, and this is where we're going to get to also what is happening with the sexualizing of our, our kids, um, is the gender theory, because out of this pops the gender theory. Um, it's this, a branch of the critical theory, and it's being implemented, and it's been pushed through policy and through scripted lesson plans, and remember, it's now reified, so it is presented as true and coming into our schools and to our kids. But it is a theory that is altogether on a level of magnitude that is more fact-resistant, irrational, and emotional than ever before. There we contend. So here are the categories in terms of this truth. Remember, now it's reified. This is now truth. This is a combination. The whole thing with Marxism is that whole division into the us versus the them. Before it was the working class versus the bourgeoisie. Working class equals good. Bourgeoisie equals bad. So this is the us versus them into the enemy and who's not the enemy. And here we have um, the categories of of um, oppression. So who are the oppressed and who is the oppressor? So the oppressed is good. The oppressor is bad. Okay, so I, I do qualify on the one side of being oppressed. The rest I don't, except I'm also short, so we need to add that there as well. <laughs> um, so my son came home with uh, a life orientation assignment. I please want to encourage his parents, read what they give your children. And he came home with this life orientation assignment. And he said, no, he's feeling a little bit uncomfortable with it. And so I, I look at this and I, oh my goodness, when you can start feeling your blood boil. And it was clearly written by a very angry young woman. Um, it was an op-ed piece. And in it, the essence was that that. Because he was male, and because, the, well, all males are dominators, inherently dominators, this comes to that whole thing, men are trash, all men are inherently dominators, and all women and girls who want to get married are actually weak. And this was what she, and it was not for them to interrogate it, or in, it was, this is, this is that reification, this is the truth, this is what it is. And then they had questions around what was in there. And so my husband and I immediately wrote, and we said, could we please set up a meeting with the, the life orientation teacher? We took it away from our boy, and we said, you are not going to read this. This is lies. And, and then we wrote, and we said, how can you tell boys, because of the nature of the gender in which, or sex in which they were born into, that they are dominators? I said, this is deeply problematic. Um, and what we didn't realize is that parents throughout that grade 10 group had done exactly the same thing. And I want to encourage you that this is the power we have as parents. 
Within two days, that assignment was retracted, and they had to reassign another assignment. Okay, so don't underestimate. Um, and this also, this is why this critical theory really burns me as a mom of two teenage boys. What did they do? So what must they go? And they say, well, God, we are very sorry that you made us male. We're very sorry. We want to repent of the fact that you created us male. And then what they must go to God, we want to repent because you made us white. You made us white, but we repent because you did that. That's their sin, according to these categories. Okay. The other structure... Okay, so let's see critical uh, theories, their truths. Remember, this is, now, this is not contested anymore. We're not allowed to contest with these things. Um, so some of their truths, all white people are racist, all men are sexist. Um, sex is not biological, but exists on a spectrum. Language can be literal violence. We're starting to see this with the hate speech bills. It's going to get tight for the pastors. <sighs> <laughs> really, and for us, denial of gender identity is literally killing someone. This is where we are. This is the reification of the postmodern political principle. And its, its proponents are imbued with a moral charge. Remember, they feel this is a moral, this is what they must morally fight against. They must, there's a moral charge to, to, to undo these, these oppressors and levels of oppression. And this has come into the universities, um, and this is why we're starting to see cancel culture, deplatforming, anything that's not in line with this. We're finding, um, even with my other colleagues, that we're starting to uh, monitor our own, what we're saying, be careful what you're going to say, you never know when it's going to go up and who's going to come for you and so forth. Um, so this comes to two philosophies. The one is John Stuart Mills, who says the point of a university is to understand the world. This is the science. This is, so even in political science, so if I want to understand what does an ideal political system look like, which one brings prosperity, which one brings stability, I don't go, oh, well, let me think about it. Um, the one which has more flowers, yes. I'm now going to decide that all countries need to have more flowers, and then if it was, but that's my decision. That's, I, I think that that's what should be. No, I'm going to look at, okay, actually, if I compare these countries, I find that the middle, with these ones all have the middle, class, the middle class starts to play a very important role. It brings in stability. We find that people are settled. They're economically settled, so they become more engaged. They get involved in their schools. They start holding uh, uh, those in positions of power accountable. And then from that, I derive that, okay, this is an important aspect of democratic stability. The other way in which and what is happening now in our universities comes from Karl Marx. And the point of a university is to change the world. And I know it sounds nice. That is not the point of a university. To change the world is a normative. To change the world according to who? According to what principles? Okay, and this is what is happening. Is we are currently raising, not all of us, um, we are currently raising activists in, in, our, in our universities. Part of the structures that is coming, and this is what we're going to get to, is, is the family. The family is considered to be deeply oppressive, and is upholding all of these, these structures um, of power and domination. So let's go back. I want to go forward. This is nothing new. So again, we, we, this is just rinse and repeat. We're just doing this one again. Um, so if we look at this is from the Soviet Union Marxist ideology, and this is from the schooling theorist. We must make the young into a generation of communists. Children, like soft wax, are very malleable, and they should be molded into good communists. We must rescue children from the harmful influence of the family. We must nationalize them from the earliest days of their little lives. They must find themselves under the beneficent influence of communist schools. Beneficent, obviously, good, all-knowing, kind knowing better than parents, to oblige the mother to give her child to the Soviet state, that is our task. We're here again. So I want to show you um, a clip, Ross, if you don't mind. This is a, um, 
feminist. This is really part of the gender theory, and she's got a very good idea that she would like to share with us. the proliferation of relationships of care, not a kind of destruction of the relationships we already have. Capitalism and um, capitalist states uh, rely really heavily on the family um, as a unit of uh, social discipline, social order, um, austerity, and um, a source of huge amounts of unpaid labor. Um, in the history of feminism, um, Abolishing the family uh, was, you know, very uh, well known as a demand, in the, particularly in the 60s and 70s, amongst uh, certain strands of women's liberation, including Shulamith Firestone's famous um, The Dialectic of Sex, where she talks about children's uh, liberation and uh, a world in which um, children and women would have much more autonomy over the households uh, in which they uh, live. It's feminists who have mounted an analysis of the private nuclear household as the site of the overwhelming majority of the rape and abuse um, that takes place on earth. Family abolition means that we deserve more. We deserve more than the sort of blackmail that tells us that we must be content with relationships uh, defined as blood um, or as nature. Um, the relationships we find uh, given to us. Um, it means that um, we could develop forms of comradeliness, forms of um, chosen, uh, or in the phrase of the xenofeminists, sort of xenofam. Xenofam can be as good as, at least as good as, um, relationships of sort of uh, biological or biogenetic um, nature. So that's one way of thinking about abolition as, as a, um, a process of um, building and growing um, all the kind of uh, forms of love and care and solidarity that we deserve. Sounds good. <laughs> Obviously I was being facetious when I said some good advice. It's always so interesting to see what she says as social cohesion and unity and austerity. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, yeah, that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> I'm not sure why that's a bad thing. Um, but just to show you, this is what's happening. Um, and there is a deliberate intention to tear down family. And just oh, what Zoe and Carl were saying, again, this undermining of parental authority and what is our role. And we need to stand firm for our kids. And this liberation of children, I don't know. I don't need any more liberation of my kids and my family. <laughs> my youngest tells me his rights. And we say to him, look, you know, in this household, we do things like this. If you don't want to live here, you can go over there. And he goes, I, I'm, you know what my, your, my right as a child is that you have to look after me. So he starts telling me what my, his rights are. So... Um, so I don't need more liberating of my children. And then actually what is happening is they want to sexually liberate. This is the next thing when I speak about, when we look at Planned Parenthood, they talk about the sexual rights of children. Okay, so uh, I'm changing it. But liberation of relationships, of care, <laughs> not a kind of destruction of the relationships we already have. Capitalism and um, capitalist states uh, rely really heavily on the family um, as a unit of... Can you? You say it was so good, we want to hear it <laughs> one more time. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk about repeating. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, Hannah Arendt. So Hannah Arendt was, she's a, a German Jew, and she was also a political philosopher. Uh, she was also a survivor of the concentration camps, and she, she studied totalitarianism. So she studied uh, the Soviet Union, and she studied Nazi Germany. Um, although the one was fascist and the other one was communist, they both are actually totalitarian. So what is totalitarianism? And she was looking at the origins of it. The definition of a totalitarian society is one in which an ideology seeks to displace all 
prior traditions and institutions with the goal of bringing all aspects of society under the control of that ideology. So what we're seeing with this critical theory is it's permeating into all aspects of policies, lawmaking, and into the schools, but it's reified because it presents itself as the truth. So it is beyond contention, it's morally right that we have to accept it, we all have to accept it, and then ultimately it's going to transform society into a utopia. So this is textbook definition, this is what I do with my students. Um, what is totalitarianism? Complete domination of every aspect of society, the polity, the economy, by a strong central state. The state actively intrudes into the personal or private realms, becomes prescriptive, especially around beliefs, norms, and values. It seeks to transform society through imposed beliefs. The control extends beyond the public and into the private. The individual is sacrificed for the so-called common good, and the enemies of the people are clearly defined in terms of groups, us versus them. Okay, this is from the totalitarianism, this is the literature that was analyzing your fascism, your communism from before. So looking familiar. Okay. Um, I argue that we're seeing a slightly different form of totalitarianism, and I argue that what we're seeing is new totalitarianism. Yes, is a blurring of the public-private lines, and there is a seeking to transform society according to a single ideology. But it's new in that what we're seeing is instead of the... Um, so, uh, uh, so Mussolini, who was a totalitarian leader, he used the state. He said, everything for the state, nothing but the state, all for the state, etc. just about the state, but he was leader of the state. But he, so he would decide what was good, but now what is happening is we're having these activists that are coming in and using the state. So they're coming in and using the state to implement policies. We see this in um, some of these debates, the 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 school curriculum debates that are happening and they are infiltrating into where these decisions are being made and they are then using the state and remember it's a reification so even though we're now dealing with this combination also the postmodernism, where it's not it doesn't have to be real and if you don't want to accept that this new truth which they're presenting as true if you don't want to accept it what they will do is they're now going to legislate that you will do it. So they're going to use a coercive method, and this is why they're bringing in laws like the hate speech bills and so forth, to compel people to, to agree to often lies, so that men can become women and women can, can become men, and you will agree to it, otherwise we will call you a transphobe uh, or whatever, and then we're going to eventually start locking you up for saying those things. So how is this coming through into the schools? Um, so this is an excerpt from the draft guidelines on gender identity and sexual orientation in the public schools of the Western Cape Education Department. I know that many have already fed into this. I know the Cause for Justice has and um, 4SA, um, but there are still some very problematic, and I want to just take just a couple of excerpts. So they are in the process. This is, this is they're expecting, they're very, it's been news headlines, they're expecting to sign this in um, shortly. So some of the, the concerns, what is the purpose of the guideline? To promote gender identity and gender expression. I thought school was about maths, science, biology, but now it's about promoting gender identity and gender expression. Um, gender expression, an LGBTQI plus learner has a right to choose the first name by which he or she wants to be known school staff and fellow learners, irrespective of his or her gender characteristics. And, but the concern here is I don't mind calling anybody any name that they want to be called. That's fine. That's your choice. But the problem here, assigned sex at birth. Assigned, do you understand this comes straight from gender theory? This is, this is gender ideology, a sex signed at birth. So in other words, a doctor, when, when your baby was born, the doctor picked up the baby and said, well, we'll have to wait and see as to what they identify as. I can't tell you what this is. <laughs> That's what they're saying. It's what they're saying. No, they, they pick up the baby and there's a very clear, so, very clear, especially with the boys. <laughs> very clear. Yes, it's a boy. <laughs> or yes, it's a girl. But what they're saying is that this is, they're even using the words that this is violence. 
You spoke violence over the child when you, when you identified using those sexual indicators that this was male or this was female. And they, so they, when they say sex assigned at birth, this is what they're talking about. When the doctor looks and says, oh, it's a boy, it's a girl. Um, and this is, this is about to be signed in. Um, integrating gender topics. Again, I really thought school was going to be about maths, English, science. Integrating gender topics into the curriculum through story problems, writing prompts, readings, and art assignments. Okay. Um, this is comprehensive sexuality education. I'm sure that you have heard about this. This is a curriculum. Please, I want, to, I want you to note that there was a fight that was fought and was actually won around this. They tried to actually make this policy that the schools had to roll this out as a part of life orientation. So this is the one area where you need to really watch for your kids is life orientation because a lot of the stuff comes in. So this comprehensive sexuality education is a guideline, and this was the, the fight that was fought. You can't make it policy and that all schools have to roll it out, but that it's a guideline. And, and I know Cause for Justice and many fought that to make it a guideline. So please, when you, what I did, and many of us as parents did, especially at primary school and then also at high school, I measured the headmaster and I said, can you please tell me, are you rolling out comprehensive sexuality education? And both of those schools then said no. And then I said, okay, fine. I said, I do want you to know that if you ever do, you, you tell me because we do not agree with it and we'll have to pull our kids out of those classes. Um, so please take your authority seriously as parents. So we, we, we message both the heads um, high school. And then if they say, oh, we have to, they don't have to. Please tell them it's a guideline. There's no compulsion. And there are wonderful programs that are alternatives. So if you go to um, Cause for Justice, they've also got alternative programs, very healthy programs. So, um, so when... When this came out, we went through the scripted plans, many of us did, and this was the feedback or what I wrote in um, when they were looking for public feedback. And so these are some of the things that I, I fed back. I went onto the site, and I can't, you can't actually go into the, 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 the scripted plans anymore. I don't know what's going on. Um, but it's still there, and it has been rolled out in many schools, and many, it's often it's that the schools think they have to, um, but they don't have to. So I put in three comments which I said were problematic. I said, firstly, the part of the content is based on an ideology rather than, than biology. Um, that distinguishing between the gender, sex, and sexual orientation, and it's a slow progression to actually separate the gender and the sex from each other and the sexual orientation and to normalize it for the kids. So starting from grade seven, and I said, um, what you're doing is you're, you're promoting the idea that gender is a social construct um, it's part of an, and rather this is actually an ideology, and this comes from the social sciences, and it's not biological. The second issue I raised was is that it undermines the role and value and authority of parents, and this is deliberate. This is what's happening. In the Educator's Guide for the Grade Fives, it warns that parents may have their own views or prejudices about their children being exposed to some of the content in the scripted lesson plans, pitting the state curriculum against the values of parents. That is what they're doing. So I think there's a, a wonderful book. Um, again, she's not necessarily a Christian, but um, not all women are feminists, and, and some women actually see the first, first wave of feminism as not, it was actually fine, and the second or third wave, it just kind of really lost the plot. Um, and, and she wrote Women Versus Feminism. It's an excellent book, especially for women. Um, criticizing the views, she wrote the following, criticizing the views and values of home and parents vastly alters the remit of the school away from education towards the promotion of a distinct political outlook. Remember where I said the totalitarianism is the promotion of a single ideology, and they are using the schools to promote this ideology. This actively breaks down the safety net of parents for our children, and this is part of what is wanted. And making them more vulnerable to pedophiles and predators. In addition, it implies that parents' values are not to be trusted, but rather the values of those pushed through the curriculum. The third comment I said was the curriculum appears to be externally driven, motivated by funding from UNESCO, and may have sinister motives, including sexualizing and thus encouraging teenage pregnancies as a market for abortion clinics. 
actually, you can actually delve into this and actually show that this is exactly what is happening. So there's more than enough evidence to show that it's even they acknowledge UNESCO funding, um, and then you just go into the Planned Parenthood, and the Planned Parenthood, um, which says the objective is to enable young people to access comprehensive sexuality education, and you know, a Planned Parenthood are abortion clinics, okay? and then to realize their sexual rights. So Planned Parenthood, together with UNESCO, is behind the Comprehensive Sexuality Education, and they are there to liberate our children so that they can exercise their sexual rights, and so they actually want them to, to have exposure to this curriculum. So I wrote here, South Africans are by, and this was my feedback, by and large religious and conservative, they have conservative values, which if promoted, because the argument they make is that we have high levels of pregnancy. So the, the answer to high levels of pregnancy is to sexualize children. <laughs> of course not. Um, so I actually said, we actually are actually, we actually largely religious and conservative. I said, but why don't we promote this? Why don't we rather encourage this? Because this will curb sexual early sexual activity. On the other hand, the CSE curriculum serves to stimulate interest in sex, undermining the natural modesty of children from an early age. So grade fours, nine-year-olds are shown graphic pictures, and I've looked at this, I've seen it, of private body parts. Grade fives, 10-year-olds are presented with sexual assault scenario where private parts are grabbed. And then grade seven, which are 12-year-olds, are told about masturbation and that it will not hurt you and others do it. This is not encouraging children to be modest, abstain, or how their bodies physically work, but it is a slow progression of sexualizing children. And one of the reasons why, I'm sorry, but I also felt the first, <laughs> is, is a, sexualizing children early is good for business for abortion clinics. And the earlier you get to them, because the research shows that when they have the first abortion, they're more likely to have more abortions. So you've got to get them early. So if you don't believe me, and here's someone from an abortion clinic to tell you this is what they do. At first, it was, again, a very much helping women to some degree, but my commission was $25 for each abortion. And my goal became to become a millionaire because simple math told me 40,000 abortions a year would make me a millionaire. And so I went about creating the market to sell 40,000 abortions a year. We had one clinic open. We opened a second one. They paid for themselves the first month. Our goal was to have uh, five surrounding the area. So I was out in schools and in other places doing everything I could to create that market because our goal was three to five abortions from every girl between the ages of 13 and 18. I'm sorry to tell you I held the hand of one young woman while she had her ninth abortion. Mm -hmm. There's over a 40% repeat rate of abortions today in this nation and in this state. Abortion is a method of birth control. Mm -hmm. So you find that girl as early as possible. You uh, convince them that her parents really don't know anything about what's good for her. You break down the natural modesty, get her to laugh at her parents and their values. If she laughs with you about them, she will not go home and tell them. And uh, then you give her low-dose birth control pills that you know she will not take accurately. And if they're not taken accurately, she'll become pregnant. Or you pass out defective or second condoms. Remember, the people that pass out those condoms don't buy the best quality. They buy seconds or defectives and you do everything you can to make certain that you're getting the three to five abortions out of every girl. Now, what do you think Planned Parenthood representatives would say to the things you just said? They right. would just say that I'm absolutely crazy and that these kids, children should be, they're going to have sex, so they need to be taught how to have safer sex. And when you, you hear someone say that, now you can just say baloney. We don't take kids out and get them really good and drunk and try to teach them how to drive safely drunk. We give them, <laughs> we give them a moral absolute, don't drink and drive. Why would we give this child a low moral standard to live down to rather than the very highest and best God's plan, abstinence until marriage, which works every time. How much time do I have, Ross? Am I over? Am I pretty over? Sorry? Let's wrap it up. 
Sorry? A rapid... <laughs> okay, so just some of the things that are coming into the schools, and I know some of the stuff, you might have seen the gingerbread person just, you know, telling kids that, you know, this is, you know, the sexual indicators are not, are blurred. Um, they were concerned about the gingerbread person because it looked too much like a man. So they changed it, and now this is the most recent one. Um, At least it's a little bit more honest. Uh, yeah, this is this has been rolled out in preschools, and that's and then the kids draw the unicorn um, because it's cute, and who wouldn't want to listen to Barney? And um, but then there it's all the mythical creatures. So at least they're honest about the mythical creature. But there you can start to see your sex assigned at birth. So it doesn't matter what the doctor said. You can just choose whatever you want, and they're starting with this. this they get to color this in in preschools. Okay, so I just want to, this is where I really want to encourage you, so I want to restore authority, and that we actually have authority as parents. And what is authority? It's the exercise of authority in the family before it is the exercise of authority in civil government. There are different spheres of authority. Remember what is happening now is the intrusion from the public into the private. But there's a family, and the civil is one part of, the state is a part, and I want to encourage you as parents that you have God-given authority as parents. And when the state starts to tell your children about the way they should go, you need to start telling them, no, that's my authority. So I want to encourage you to step up into your positions of authority as parents, and knowing that you're God-given authority, and he's greater than all those, the state authority. Okay, so it's a building block of society. That's why they're so scared of it. They want to atomize society, undermine it, and then sexualize our children. Okay, let's get practical. Be grounded. God, family, friends, going back to that first picture, enjoy your families. Enjoy being together. I mean, if we don't actually emulate that for the world, then, then what is attractive? If we're not having fun as our families, if we're not enjoying it, if we're not being together, if we're not having big parties at our house, then what's the point? Spend time with God. Enjoy life. Understand the responsibility and God-given authority as parents and take it up. And pray at home with your kids and at school. So please, if you're not part of the prayer group at your school, get part of the prayer group of your school. Start a prayer group in your school. Um, educate yourselves. We can't be ignorant in these times. And be vigilant and respond. Please call those teachers. Call that headmaster. Find out what's going on. I just heard of parents who were telling me that there's a teacher that was busy grooming, and they said, their child, and they said, what should they do? I said, you immediately go and see the teacher, and you say no. And so we need to take up our authority, become involved. Probably one of the most powerful things you can do is the school governing bodies. Get yourselves onto the school governing bodies. This is in public schools, this is where policy comes. The school governing body, parents, and the other teachers are the ones that make policy. Please get onto your school governing bodies. Act in love with courage based on truth. And if need be, be open to other schooling options. Sometimes we eventually, and I'm not a, a proponent, I think whatever the Lord leads you and also what house your child, you, you start taking. So for us, we our kids are in public schools, um, but there may have been a time where we would have to consider other schooling options. And so obviously, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be in public schools or private schools or you could be homeschooling, just be open. So I want to leave you with this, encourage you, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It's what we owe our children. Nicola, we're going to ask you a few questions later when you sit on the couch. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for understanding where we are and why we're here, uh, to understand the context of the problem, and also it empowers us. So thank you very, very much. Amen. Thank you. We're going to be served lunch. Are we going to be served lunch or do we come and dish up?
kann uns geserviert werden. Okay. Like, so we'll be served lunch. You're welcome just to sit. And I want you just to think through what you heard today, because we're going to have a short opportunity to ask our speakers some questions while they sit on the couch. Um, but let's sit around, talk to the people around you. If you're at a table and uh, there are not many people at the table, please sit at the table where there are more people. Group together. Father, we thank you for the grace, for your providential grace, what we started with God. We thank you for the fact that you are always at work, that in you we live, we move, and we have our being. And we thank you, God, that you are at work in us as individuals, in our families, and our communities, that you are renewing all things in Christ, God. And we thank you for the, for the participation that we can have with that. So bless our meals to our body, even as you bless our souls, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, donkey. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, Ross has asked for some kind of closing argument, <laughs> um, but maybe I, I obviously was getting enthusiastic in the beginning and maybe rushed the end, um, so I just really want to reiterate that we mustn't be discouraged by this. Sometimes my husband and I, we both like look at each other with wide eyes, and we like, uh, I, we just feel so overwhelmed, and, and also with Ray and we chat, and we're like, really, can we really do anything? And then we're like, what, what else can we do but stand? And, and I think we don't, you know, we have to just know who our God is and um, we have to just stand. So I, I think one of the things for me as well is just to encourage each of us, um, those of you who are, are parents, um, but not just as parents, but what has been taken away and has been slowly whittled away, but we've also done it, we've given it away, is our areas of authority, our God-given areas of authority. So I just want to perhaps just reiterate that as that God has delegated areas of authority, um, and underpinning it is firstly that self-government. So we have a requirement to govern ourselves and to teach our kids to govern themselves because the, the less that we self-govern, the more the external comes in and starts to actually take over those areas. So we have to also teach our kids self-control, and we have to be self-controlled. So there aren't the need for more and more laws to become intrusive. And then the other side is to actually recognize the lanes that have been given. Because so each sphere of authority has, has a jurisdiction and an authority. So we have an authority over our family. We don't have an authority over somebody else's family. Um, but in the same way, the state doesn't have an authority into my family, unless there's obviously an abuse. But in general, around the moral and those issues, it's it, we have been given to the commission to raise our families in the ways of the Lord. Um, and so then also the other spheres is the church. And again, this is what's happening is the state is going to start to try and intrude with the, you know, there's non-conversion therapy laws and then the hate speech bills. It's, it's an intrusion. And, and I know at one stage they even wanted to read the sermons. It's coming and we have to pray and trust the Lord to keep those spheres, um, you know, in their lanes in the same way the state and this is what's happening is it's coming into areas which it's not supposed to. So there's a pushback, but also to recognize that there's a greater authority over all of these authorities, and that's God. And, and so the family is a God-given sphere. It's, it's from him, and we as parents are the authority in that sphere. So whenever something comes, we go, no, not your area, God-given area, and we give accountability to him. Okay, I'd like to do two things. The first is, <clears throat> here's an example of the book that Carl and Zoe were talking about. Uh, it's Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Porn Proofing Today's Young Kids. Um, this is the version for the 6 to 12-year-olds. Um, and then there's a 3 to 5, 3 to 6-year-old one, which is the one that I first saw. And my kids are 4 and 6, and I'm like, I want that book now. And I couldn't get one because they're still busy printing it. <laughs> um, Ryan Smith, who's his cause for justice, bought the rights to publish and print this book here in South Africa. And they're busy printing, I think they're printing a thousand of the kids' versions now. Um, I think he's selling them for 150 bucks. So I've actually shown this to my, teach, my son's teacher at the school, and they want two copies for the library. I think if in every school, in every home, every home school, something like this is just really, really useful to use. Um, so if you want to have a look at it, I've got some copies. If you want to take a, take a squiz. Um, 
to do this. We take his turn. Yes, it's my <laughs> <laughs> Um, just this week, uh, I spoke to a lady who's busy translating it in, in the Afrikaans version. So I don't know if you're aware of that, but yes. she said it's still going to take some time. Yeah, so they've, they've taken this, they're translating it to uh, Zulu, Afrikaans, I think Kosa, and they're also going to, you know, it's predominantly European children in this, so they're going to okay. make it, they're going to put a Google or two in, and, uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. multiracial. So okay to make it fit into South Africa. Mm, but yeah, this, this version, I think they've got a thousand of this one, and then they're going to be printing some of the other stuff as well. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> My second point is, um, as I've spoken about these things and I've spoken with uh, people in the church around these issues, there's been this massive surge in churches as we've talked about it. Um, I think the first thing is that God is telling us to wake up, stop playing around now, because you realized you didn't care about this until they came into your school and after your children. You realized for the last 10, 15 years you haven't done anything, and now all of a sudden everybody's worried about it. There's an urgency to take what God's teaching us and teaches us seriously to start living that out and to working it out. The second thing is that you need to decide which side of the, whose side are you on? As Nicola was talking last night, when the angel that comes before Joshua is like, you're on the Lord's side or you're not. Who are you afraid of? Are you afraid of what the crowd, the mob will say to you? Or do you stand with what God asks of you? And I've had to do that for myself. I'm being threatened with being reported to the Health Professionals Council. I trigger people through the talks that I give. Uh, you know, they're going to report me to the university, lose my position there. What does that mean for me? What is that? How are we going to work that out? Um, and th that ties into this thing that you need to have things in the right way, in the right order. It starts off with God and your relationship with Jesus Christ, studying that, being in the Word. And the next step from that is to focus on the family. The biggest impact that you as a mother or a father can have is in the family. Go home, love your wife, love your husband, love your kids and raise them. That is the most powerful impact that you could have on South Africa. And then taking that family into the church and families together making the church, having that, and that is how we, that's how Jesus changed society. He took, you know, from nothing, within 400 years, the Roman Empire was Christian. That's how it built from that process with God at the center of it and then the family, then the church, then the society, then the universities. And this attack on the structure of, of us is coming from universities into the media, going after the children, going after us. So they understand the methodology, the mechanism. That's why there's the hate for the family. And he is in control, as you've said. So you know, it's, it's a call to arms in some ways. Get serious about it. And I would also hope that from something like this, it didn't just stop there. You know, it's like... So what now? Just in that what now, tomorrow, um, Andre Webster, who's a sexologist in the area and a pastor at El Shaddai Church, he'll come to, um, he wanted to be part of this panel today, but uh, he is only flying back this afternoon. But he'll be ministering both in the morning and the evening about sex, sexuality, and God's will. So just in general way. But uh, here's a few courses that uh, we will try and facilitate us in into how do, we, how do we think publicly about sexuality, but also bring a lot of wholeness, you know, because of violence and abuse, because of molestation, and also just how do we as parents. So he's got a few courses that he runs and that he's going to roll out here, and we'd love to train a few facilitators. So if you look at the bottom of your seat, you'll see that there's a... <laughs> <laughs> There's a card if your name is on, then you're a facilitator. No, great. <laughs> That's great. I wanted to give an opportunity to a few people who have questions. Just We only have time for two questions or three questions. Um, if you have a question for these two, just about your children, parenting, school, something in that area. Derek, I'm going to give the microphone. A question to whoever wants to answer it. Um, the... Just the idea of how do you deal with other parents that maybe don't have a background in see it's important or, you know, 
kids will be kids and all those arguments. Um, how do you start that conversation and, and kind of guiding your, your child, but in the atmosphere or in the perspective of they are in a group, but, but specifically with other parents? You know, uh, we do this, where um, <laughs> one hopes that one is is influencing. So, so I think this is something that I think Raisa and many of us have had on our hearts is is that there's a massive need. So I hear you on the one on one, but on a greater thing is that you actually have to start influencing the culture, and this is the salt and light. So we we're starting to do more and more of this, and the Lord has really opened where you actually are equipping. So I think one is, is to equip fellow Christians and fellow Christian parents in this kind of a platform. On the one-on-one, -on -one, we also have to be respectful that not everybody is Christians. So we can't evaluate or expect people to act in the same way of those who are not um, renewed um, to, to act in a way that has been renewed. So one has to also be respectful in the sense that we cannot control other people. That's not our place. We can be salt and light, and we can be influencers, and we can be respectful. But um, yeah, I think there's th things that we also have to, like with other parents, with our own children, there are boundaries that we can place. So with, with other parents and other expectations, there's, there's certain things that they cannot be exposed to, our children cannot be exposed to. and. Um, so in that way, you can create boundaries as the authority of your children. Um, and then also in that way, for us, we, we moved home with also the purpose of becoming a, a teenage net. So we moved close to the school. Um, we got a place with a swimming pool. And it's close to a place where the boys can go play soccer. And um, we also tried to move the, the locus of the influence into our home. So... So um, my thoughts are, what is good, what God has decreed is good, is good for everybody, not only Christians. It's, an, it's the law of what he says, like, um, don't have sex outside the marriage. That's a biblical principle. But cultures recognize that a marriage is, is sacred and that when you break it, it causes problems. And you have outside pregnancies. And we can so, show in sociology that... You have multiple partners, you, your, your happiness factors goes down. Uh, children born out of wedlock do worse. So when you're talking about these issues, we share in a school a public space that we all share, particularly in, in public schools, that everybody has to be able to move across. These universal values of what is good and right, when I put my thing up there, everybody knows what's good or right. So setting systems up pushing the school governing bodies, being on them and influencing an environment where if it were Christians on the majority or Muslims on the majority or atheists on the majority, the school environment would still allow you to function freely and safely. So those, that type of principle when you're making decisions. So I know that every other mother and father generally has got the best interest of their child at heart. What is the best interest for their child? Now, not from a Christian perspective, but from just, you know, in general, not being exposed to pornography. Can we all agree on that? Cool. No sexual training there. This is how the stuff that you put it in. So when, when people hear about CSE, the non-Christians or people that are not aware of it will go, that's not an issue. But then they see the images and they'll go, I don't want my six-year-old looking at it. So that's how, and then it's you actually taking that conversation into the school governing body and or into the environment. And so I text this to my teachers, my boy's teacher, and then she says, cool, I want, now these books are going to be in the library. And I'm going to try and see if I can't buy 20 of them and maybe we can give it or say, come and get it from at the school so that the people in my child's environment are going to have this type of training or the opportunity to get that training. So that's the, you will get guys that are pushing that agenda because they believe in it, but then, you know, there will be some conflict, but again, you're trying to work in a common sphere. The biggest problem is that if you're not involved, if you just back off, and like in the past, you know, when we were at school, like, you know, it was going to get an inverted commas Christian education, just leave it, off you go. That's a thing of the past. So you reminded me, um, yours was a very good answer. So... <laughs> 
So, um, in the school governing body, when you when you sit, anyone on school governing bodies here? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so one of the things is that you think you're going in as a parent and you're representing as a parent, but you're actually not. You actually then kind of you have to represent the school, because there are teachers on the school governing body. There's admin staff, and then there's the principal, and then there's parents. So the parents are the majority, and. You have to be guided by the principle, is this in the best interest of the school? And that's exactly what you're saying. So um, we have this push for a diversity policy in our school and a drafting of a diversity policy. And um, a particular person with a certain slant um, presented this diversity policy and I'm like, no, this is typical of what we're currently seeing in the whole critical theory, well, gender theory. And, and, I, and then I fed back, I said, look, if we're talking about diversity as pluralism and an environment where the kids, um, you know, the individual kids and they feel uh, that they can flourish, then, then, then I'm all for diversity. I said, but if we are defining diversity in terms of specific grievances and as an opportunity to elevate those interests above other interests, then I don't think this is in the best interest of the school. And I think this is going to lead to polarizing, and actually we can see this in other schools, especially in America, where it leads to polarizing. So you can actually argue for it, and the thing is with this as well, as, it, as you were saying, what is in the best interest of the school, because these principles will be in the best interest of everyone and the school, so, yeah. Sorry? It was a good answer. Yeah, I have to on the first one. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, that was Cole. Can, but can you can we speak over the microphone? Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, guys. So uh, just one question. I think you, you kind of briefly touched on it also. Um, uh, but just for, for current parents and prospect, prospecting parents, is there a message of com comfort uh, when entering these school systems and when you are serving on a, um, the, body, uh, the, the, the school board or whatever, is there a message of comfort to say that, listen, we do, uh, your parents do actually have an influence or can have a say, because um, I'm just thinking of an example, uh, uh, an high school in, in, in Gauteng, Noortebel, who is currently busy in stating like unisex bathrooms. Now, um, when I asked out about it, it's, it's apparently, it's, it's law that these sh things should happen. So what, what um, influence does parents have, do parents have in, in these things? Can you start in case you <laughs> have FOMO? I hope it will be better. <laughs> so, just on that statement, there's no law anywhere in South Africa that says you must have unisex bathrooms. This is part of the education thing. You, no school must take the government CSE regulations. It's not. Schools have, particularly private schools, pr private schools more so than public schools, but public schools are run by school governing bodies. They have massive degrees of autonomy. They get a curriculum in what they should be taught in general, but the content of it is, there's nothing on it. There is no law that says you must have unisex bathrooms. I know, because we've commented on the most progressive law, which is the Western Cape one, it doesn't say that. What it does say is that you m might need to make accommodation, reasonable accommodation for somebody of the opposite, of who's a transgender person. What does that mean? We actually think that the best way to deal with that is to have unisex bathrooms. So that, that process, I've, I've been involved in about three or four schools now that are going through this transgender issue because there's somebody, a child that's transitioning. In two of them, the gov school governing body has capitulated and given up the definition of what it means to be a boy or a girl. So they keep all their regulations the same, but they say a boy is whatever the child defines himself as. So if the boy says, I'm a boy, he's a boy. If the girl, boy says, I'm a girl, then he is a girl and treated like a girl. The school governing body there has lost it. They've lost the absolute foundation. They've given up the biological reality and have replaced it with ideology. The other schools have said, no, this is a disorder, a problem, a, a challenge that this child is facing. We need to accommodate somebody with the problem. How do we accommodate this child with a clinically diagnosed problem in a reasonable way, taking into account everybody else's 
everybody else's regulations. The, the school governing body there has got, on average, maybe slightly more Christian spin on it. There's more Christians in it. One or two in particular that have taken the time to get involved in this, and they've been able to stop it and say, let's get a policy that makes sense. In the capitulation thing, when anybody can be a woman, then nobody is a woman. So then everything that a woman stands for no longer exists. Then there is no women's sports or women's segregation or women's toilets or women's achievements. They are not even parents or mothers. They're just birthing persons. The people that, by accepting the, the, the grounds on which they accepted their child, they've given into the entire philosophy. Not because they did, wanted to do it, just because they didn't think it through and under pressure they caved. So the power in the South African setting that resides within the school governing body is, is extreme. Not extreme, it's significant. And if you are in those positions, you have a significant amount of impact. Um, so I must say that the, those draft uh, regulations, which the Western Cape, uh, which I referred to, has, has been, if you look at it, there's been lots of input into it. And so there's a lot of the words may. There's, no, there's often not a should. Um, so I also want to encourage you to, to have a look at it. And is there a may? Because what people will say is they'll, they'll hope that you haven't read it and they'll go, you must. And then when you go into the legislation and say, well, because often it says we're reasonable, accommodation, we're reasonable. And also what some of the words that, I mean, this is, this is, this is you know, cause for justice, this is for essay. These are people who have inputted. If it's, look, it must take into cog cognizance the rest of the children. So something like allowing a boy to play girls' sports is not in the interest of those girls. Or allowing a biological boy into a girls' change room is not in the broader interest of the school. So those are the kind of things which actually even inside there, there, is, there are kind of, you say, well, this is actually not in the broad interest. So, so go and have a look at what has been written. The other thing is, are you all aware of DOSA? It's a phenomenal um, civil society feedback tool in terms of legislation. So one of the current legislation at the moment is the Schools Act. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to whittle away the, the public school because the school governing bodies have so much authority. And the typical, they want to centralize it and give it more national power. So this is currently, um, they've got new legislation where they're trying to increase the national government authority. They're also trying to whittle away the authority of um, home schools. Um, and this is a typical strategy. So like in Sweden, there are, there's no homeschooling allowed because how can you indoctrinate and spread your propaganda if you've got these independent associations busy raising up independent-minded children? So um, we, these are things that we need to act in now. So if you go to the DSA website, you'll see the, 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 the legislation is there for comments, and, and we need to be commenting. We need to start now, but also then read um, the comment that, you know, what, what is really there, because there's often feedback, and you'll see there's more a may than a, a must. Yeah. Um, um, I'm Suzanne and I'm a high school teacher in St at Stellenberg here around the corner and I actually don't have a question. I do want to thank you um, for coming today, but I actually want to reassure you as parents. I'm not a parent, but I feel like I parent 1,500 <laughs> teenagers, <laughs> um, but I love teaching in our public school. Um, Stellenberg is a public school, which means it's, it's basically run by our governing body. Um, and we have very solid staff members. Yes, we do have a few that are not born again Christian, I think. Um, they're not too um, outspoken about it. But we do have quite a, the, the way we run the school is a way that I enjoy being there and teaching. Um, and I do, the, I think the best thing for us is parents that are involved and parents that pray at school. Um, the mamas that bit, they come once a week and they come and strengthen our hands. And we do see that the children that flourish the most in our school are those who come from solid, loving families. Um, in a I think um, 
having children this time, yes, you do get anxious and yes, you think, how can this happen? But we, our children are given to us for a time such as this. And they are equipped and God, the Holy Spirit helps us and equips them for this time and to be able to handle all the digital stuff that we actually don't know anything about. And I'm encouraged to know more about those things. Um, I'm not going to be on TikTok, but I am on Instagram, but I think I should equip myself better. Um, but to be involved and to communicate with your children. I also think that communication from a young age, um, we do have children who have both. Um, I spoke to a grade nine girl last year. Um, she had to phone her mom and she said she couldn't get hold of her mom, but she'll phone her other mom. And I'm like, your other mom? Oh yes, my mom's a lesbian. And I'm like, oh really? <laughs> and then I, I ask her questions about it. We are exposed to that. Yes, it's hap it happens in our schools, but to love them, to, to be equipped today, to know what the differences are and when is it really, when is it medically or whatever, and when is it only a new philosophy that's coming along. It helped me a lot. I wish we were a lot more teachers here that can be equipped um, and that can actually, via a parent evening, be get people in to speak to the parents because I do think that we as a society are not equipped. So thank you, Ross, for a date like today. Um, but you can send your kids to normal schools at this stage and pray with them and make a difference in society. Um, yeah. Thank you, Susan. It is necessary, yeah. It's absolutely true. We thank God for good governing body people like Nicola and Toby and many others. We're going to close today because of our commitment to your time. And um, I want to thank you. Right, Sabai, Danke. Nicola, thank you. It was really good that you were here. Thank you. We were talking over lunchtime. The hours of preparation that have gone into the research that you're living, that you're propagating acting as prophets in our, in our time. Thank you for the hours. Thank you for the effort. And um, I'm going to close in praying a blessing over you and also for our community. And uh, they'll still be around for a few minutes if you want to ask some questions. But thank you so much. Father, we thank you for, for times such as this. We thank you for this day, God. We thank you for the gift of knowledge, the gift of revelation, God. And, and I pray that you will help us hear what the Spirit is saying to us, God. Help us to discern. Help us to respond, God. And we're just a handful from our communities, God, but we pray for a grace that what you've entrusted to us, God, will first be cultivated in our own souls, in our own families, and then in our churches and our communities, God. We pray in Jesus' name. You say, God, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you do raise a standard. So we thank you for raising a standard today, God. And we pray that the word that was sown to us, God, will grow into fruitful trees for the sake of our community, God. In Jesus' name, we pray that you will bless Nicola, God. We pray that you will bless Reitzer. We pray that you will bless Cole and, and Zoe, God. We pray for that what you've entrusted to them, God. We pray that you will sustain them, keep them fired up, keep them energized, God. Keep them, keep them hearing and responding to your spirit, God. And we pray that their voice will be elevated and loud and clear in this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye, Donkey. Thank you.